Hello again, as you may or may not know, I am Eli the Computer Guy and INE has invited me down here to their Durham, North Carolina offices in order to do a number of interviews with networking professionals. I'm here with Will Merle today, Senior Network Engineer at Unicom Systems Inc. Yes. <laughs> yes. That would be it. That would be it. So, okay, so I guess the qu first question is, is what is Unicom Systems Inc? Unicom Systems is a subsidiary yeah. of Unicom Global. Uh, Unicom Global has <laughs> their hands in a whole lot of different pies. So okay. Unicom Systems itself is overall software company, so we got a lot of software products. Uh, came from the Macro 4 pro portfolio. Uh, also, a lot of IBM products, so hmm. their business intelligence stuff, yeah. um, Focal Point, Purify Plus, which is used for cleaning up code and everything. So uh, they made some acquisitions, purchased that. So now Unicom has those. Uh, our actual office here in the Raleigh, Durham area, does professional services, though. We're the only office for Unicom Systems that actually does that. So we do consulting and design and, and all that good stuff. Okay, and so what do you do as like a senior network engineer? Like, what's <laughs> sort of, kind of, sort of, what's your job look like? What don't I do? Yeah. Um, so I, I focus mainly on, on the network stuff, routing, switching. Uh, I've taken on the wireless portion now that we had uh, our wireless engineer leave. Um, I'm starting to dabble in virtualization, so VMware and stuff okay. as well. Um, system stuff. We do have a, a senior systems engineer that, that does that, but I'm kind of his his backup. So I'm I'm good with Windows, Linux, all that mm -hmm. good stuff, yeah. um, and uh, I just voice yeah, uh, security. Just... <laughs> uh, I really I wear a lot of hats. So, so do you do that internally then, or do you go out to client sites? We go out to in? client sites. Yeah. We uh, consult with them. So we've uh, got a few companies in the area that we do that for. Uh, also, if they have anything internally that needs done, you know, yeah. if they need some assistance, I'm always there to lend a helping hand. So yeah. they, uh, they like to lean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so then how did you start? So it says you have, it's always funny when you see this, 15 plus years. 15 what does, plus what does years. Plus mean? Does that mean 16 years or does that mean 15 years and two it months? It means that I, I don't like going on LinkedIn and typing a whole lot. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so I, I hit the, the 15 years. So, <laughs> so uh. basically what happened was um, I started with technology and, and yeah. stuff like that whenever I was a teenager. Yeah. Uh, professionally speaking, I didn't get into it until I was in the Army okay, yeah. uh, where I was actually getting a paycheck for it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's where I'm kind of starting that, that timer at. Okay, you know, yeah, it was yeah. whenever I started in the military. Yeah. So uh, I, I hit that 15 year mark from the time that I got in and I was like, oh, I can just ride a 15 here and, <laughs> and you know, add a little plus and that'll cover me for at least another five years. So I, you know, once I hit 20, I can, I can change it to a 20. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's a little bit laziness on my part. You know? yeah, right. That's why I like automation, I guess. <laughs> So then you went, and so you started in the Army then in 99, right? Yeah, well, no, so I started in the Army, I actually got in in 2000. 2000, yeah. Real. Okay. yeah. So what, what, what made you do that decision then? What was the... Aimlessness? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was kind of, I was kind of uh, at a loss of what I was doing. Um, so I actually went to college initially uh -huh. for uh, dance. <laughs> yes. Well, there you go. I was I I was a competitive dancer. Did you know ballet, jazz? Yeah, you were a competitive, yeah, not was, just college. But not not just really? I was a competitive dancer. So that's actually actually a thing. <laughs> not everybody knows that, yeah, yeah. but uh, it's actually you know a, a big thing that they got. So uh, the show Dance Moms. You know, okay, have, you, that, yeah, so, yeah. so I think it's on TLC or something. My my daughter and yeah. her friend are I, obsessed with it. Yeah. But uh, no, so uh, competitive dancing, I did that for, for years. Really? And uh, I ended up getting a scholarship to University of Illinois to do that. And hmm. my sister was actually the reason why I dropped out and came back home because she had cancer. Right. Um, she had a relapse and I got kind of depressed about the whole thing and yeah. ended up uh, getting out and coming back home. And she started getting better and I was like, well, do I really want to go back and, and kind of take that back up again or mm -hmm. do I want to do something else? So um, I started going to the community college and they had a, a tech course there for CCNA yeah, okay. for networking. And since I'd already, 
been interested in computers and dealt with networks a little bit from whenever I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, that's a whole separate story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. And I ended up getting my CCNA then okay. uh, for the very first time. Yeah. And uh, from there, uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And yeah. I ended up uh, joining the Army. Okay. And um, I got kind of fooled whenever I picked my job. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? How's well, that? so the name yeah. of the uh, the 31 Foxtrot uh, MOS yeah. was Network System Switching Operator Maintainer. Yeah, and I was like, that. it says network and it says <laughs> systems. It's It's got to be, you know, computers and stuff. It's yeah. not. It's, oh, oh. oh, it was like analog legacy uh, telephone yeah, yeah. systems. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where the operator comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so... I was a little disappointed. Um, there was some data portions like, you know, X.25 packet switch networks. Oh, you actually used that? Yeah. I've never heard oh. of that. Okay. Oh, yeah. It was, it was um, we're talking old school stuff. We're talking the big floppies were running the whole system. Uh, okay. um, and <laughs> so they started introducing uh, uh, upgrades into the, uh, the switches, as we call them, which are the actual enclosures that sat on the back of like a five ton truck or a Humvee and stuff. Yeah. And um, they started putting like HP switches in there or Cisco switches. Yeah. Huh. Okay. And um, I kind of got hooked up with a warrant officer while I was in Korea who was doing all these installs and I started asking a lot of questions. Okay, yeah. And um, he answered those questions and yeah. he, he liked that I was very, you know, a go-getter about the whole thing. And yeah. I uh, kind of followed him around and, oh, okay. and, and started learning more and more about you. So I already had that. But I mean, we're talking back in 99, the CCNA was kind of, you know, yeah, not a whole lot to it, not like today. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but uh, so I'd got more and more knowledge under my belt. Yeah. And as uh, things progressed while I was in the military, the equipment got better and better okay. and better. And yeah. then we had like the, uh, by the time I got out, we had the joint network node. Okay. And the JNN was virtually all COTS equipment in there. So okay. we had a nipper side and a sipper side. Okay. Uh, normal internet and secret internet, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had exchange servers, we had call yeah. managers, we did VoIP phone systems, and we uh, had our own PBX in there yeah. uh, where we could do two wire phones and we would drop uh, these, these hard green boxes that had switches in there so everybody could you know, link up to it. We mm -hmm. did high speed satellite shots and all, yeah. I mean, so yeah. we're, we're dealing with current generation equipment by this time, you yeah. know, configuration of it, troubleshooting of the links and all that good stuff. So yeah. a ton of experience there. I knew the system cold just because of how involved I had been with it before. Yeah. And uh, because all the stuff that the warrant officer was doing was, was uh, really uh, building to that. Okay. Um, General Dynamics was the key contractor that was designing the system. Hmm. And um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, what ended up happening is General Dynamics came to me because I had trained uh, some of the soldiers who weren't able to attend the, the training class. Okay. And uh, they were like, do you want to be a trainer when you get out? Oh, and yeah. so they offered me a job as a trainer teaching the new JNN system to uh, first the soldiers that were going to deploy with the system because we actually were the first operational JNN in Iraq. Really? And um, the... Uh, what happened, though, was yeah. uh, because my knowledge was so valuable, they stop lost me. I was supposed to get oh. out after five years, yeah. uh, oh. ended up doing the deployment, got out after six. Um, oh, and that job wasn't there anymore, so I had to find something, and that's what ended up bringing me to the Raleigh-Durham area. That's right. So it, if you're dealing with the modern military, because you know, I, I served in the, the mid-90s, and that, that was a thing, is the technology, the, the military. We were literally still learning. We had to, we had to learn vacuum tubes. Oh, like, oh yeah. Mean. Well, no. So, so the original equipment, I was, oh, there was a lot of vacuum tube stuff. Yeah. Had an ele electronics repair. Yeah. We had all that stuff going on. So we had to be able to you know, fix that stuff at the start. It was, yeah. it was not until a few, after I'd been in a few years. So we actually got the new uh, joint network node equipment in t towards the end of 2004, beginning of 2005. Okay. And uh, that's when all of that stuff, you know, the, the first ones yeah. kind of rolled out and everybody started training on the things. Yeah. So um, everything was kind of lead up. They were doing like one for one replacements of, yeah. of certain components in the older 
switches and stuff. So do you think if somebody joined now, would they still have to worry about that? Is oh, that no. So no. Um, most of the branches now, except in a few key areas, yeah. uh, you might run into it like in Korea or, or parts of Germany. Okay, you know, yeah. some of the old holdovers, they might still have some of the old fesses and 39 deltas and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, most of the stuff should be, you know, normal COTS equipment now no, for, on, the, on the combo side of things. Yeah, so you're going to be more more often than not working with uh, current grade technology. So. Oh, okay. so you come out of the army and then, then what did you decide to do? How did you? <laughs> so I, it basically came down to who gave me a job offer letter first. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, well, so, okay. So how did you, how did you get the job offer? Cause that's one of the things, again, at least in my service, they always said, when you get out, people are going to be lining up to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and I got out, <laughs> and it was like a you know. Ghost um, town. So how did that work? I was you? luckier yeah. than than most, um, just because of how well I knew the technology, okay. and and because that applied experience and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I think I was driven a whole lot by the need to support my family, yeah, as okay. well as yeah. you know yeah. my love of yeah. all things technology. So um, I I'm an avid reader. Okay, I yeah. just love reading whatever I can get my hands on. So I'll, I'll read a tech manual. I'll read, you know, fiction stuff, just whatever yeah. is at hand. If I'm bored, I'll pick it up and yeah. start reading. Um, and so I was very up to date and, and current with everything. Okay. And uh, I interviewed for a few weeks yeah. um, leading up. By the time I got back, I think I had a month and a half before I actually ETS'd okay. out, out of the Army. And uh, I just started taking, you know, uh, throwing my resume out there. Okay. And um, the two big contenders yeah. were um, CenturyTel. I think they're CenturyLink now. Yeah, okay. But yeah, yeah. Uh, they're based out of Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And then AT&T. Okay. Yeah. So I interviewed with both of them. Um, and uh, CenturyTel had a lot of red tape to go through yeah. um, just because it was a direct position with them. Um, AT&T was a contractor position through another company. Hmm, okay. So it was kind of streamlined. They talked to me and then you know, within like a day or two, they had already talked to the contract company and said, we want to hire this guy. Hmm. So um, the, uh, it was just a matter of who gave me that letter first. It was yeah. either Louisiana or uh, here in the Raleigh Durham area. And, and they got me the letter first, so I was like, "Okay, let's let's do this thing." Uh-huh. So uh, that's how I ended up down here. So would you, especially for the military folks that are getting out now, like there can be a lot of issues with transition that, oh, that yeah. nobody even talks about. You're just sitting there all of a sudden. You think you're going back to the normal life, and all of a sudden, normal life isn't what you remember normal life to be. Mm-hmm. Is there? Do you have any like lessons learned, like of that of the transition from going to the army to AT and T? What you could have done better, or what helped you in that transition? Well, you know, it's even now. I mean, compared to what the military is at now, so they're not really <laughs> dealing with all the deployments and stuff that everybody was dealing with, you know, ten years ago. Yeah. So it was a hard to transition for a lot of the guys that I know, yeah. you know, and, and and myself and everything, getting out from that. Um, but even even then, you yeah. know, going from military discipline <laughs> to the civilian world where your boss may or may not care what you're doing, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. they're not keeping up with you about your work, they're not checking up behind you. Yeah. Um, well, if you're lucky, you know, and you don't have a micromanager. But um, it, it's more of just being conscious of, of, of what you're doing, being self, you know, uh, uh, responsible. Yeah, you know yeah, that's okay. the, the that's the biggest thing. I mean, you're responsible for your training. The mm-hmm. army's, you know, nobody's going to come up to you with you know, within reason. And, you know, sometimes a, a, a part of your job comes up and they say, "Well, you need to learn this, so you're going to have to go do this." But yeah. a, lot of, a lot of times, you know, you're you're having to do self training, yeah, right? Yeah. So you're you know going into that, and you have to keep up with that yourself to make sure your skill set is as solid as it needs to be. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say that's probably the biggest thing is just yeah. being responsible for yourself yeah. instead of relying on somebody else, your NCO or whoever, to be responsible for you. Yeah, yeah. that's that's probably the biggest you know challenge, especially if you were lower uh, enlisted. Okay. So. And then, so I imagine if you came out with electronic certification, you probably had a clearance. Mm -hmm. Has that, as you've gone, 
Has that, have you weighed that for the jobs you take? Have you kept your clearance? Have you bothered? Have you, um, do you wish you well, had Well, so the, the, the clearance thing actually came up while I was at AT&T um, because I had my top secret clearance. Yeah. AT&T uh, had a few positions um, inside dealing with some of their customers because I was doing client support, managed network services type of thing. Yeah. That allowed me to play in that area and, and keep my uh, clearance. Yeah. Um, with uh, and then it kind of went along, and it's it's fallen by by the wayside just because yeah. I I don't need it anymore. Okay. Um, it's you know obviously in an inactive state, and yeah. it's just sitting there. It would be easy or for me to get my clearance than yeah. somebody who's never had one. But I I would say clearance, if you have a clearance yeah. and you can get a job that allows you to keep it, yeah. whether you're actually using it or not, but a company that's willing to take it on because they have other areas that cover that, do it. Do it. Okay. Do it because <laughs> it opens up so many additional doors for you right. when, okay. when it comes to you know positions and, and jobs and everything. Yeah, yeah. just uh, having that already in place. because yeah. because getting it is a nightmare. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, it just it takes forever to get your clearance finalized, depending on the level. Yeah, you know, yeah. top secret, yeah, that's going to take a long time. Secret, not so much. Yeah, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, top secret costs a whole lot of money for a company to go through the process of getting it done because they've got to send agents out to talk to people and all this other stuff. So yeah, um, yeah. so if you have it, try to keep <laughs> if it. If you have it, try to keep it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So is that something like when you went in, did you know what clearance you were going to get? Like especially if you go into the army, can you say, "Oh, I know, I know, I should get a top secret clearance." So get me something, <laughs> give me a top secret. It, no, um, yeah. so it just <laughs> depends on oh. what you're doing. So yeah. your your normal just so what I had um, normally for yeah. the position I had only requires a secret, but because of some of the uh, locations I worked at and, and other things like that yeah. required me to upgrade my clearance and uh, so that's the reason why I ended up getting out with a higher level clearance than someone normally would have with the MLS I had. Oh, okay, okay. And so then you went over to AT&T and you spent like three years there yes. so what do you do and, and there's He's got like a whole page of stuff he did at AT&T. So, 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 so yeah. summarize that and uh, uh, <laughs> scut work. No, um, mm -hmm. no, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, AT&T was an interesting experience because yeah. um, that was really the first time I had been introduced to uh, variances in, in network styles. You know, because uh, the, yeah. the 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 army, you know, is everything's kind of there yeah, it's yeah, supposed yeah. to be in a particular way and it's always going to be that way no matter where you deploy <laughs> or anything like that it's going to be this way yeah, yeah. and um what happened at at and um i worked uh the gcsc the global client support center okay. and that was kind of focused on their big 12 customers right okay. so we're talking postal service uh, pepsi metlife you know big companies yeah. and um the uh they all have little different quirks when it comes mm -hmm. to their networks. Yep. And um, so I, I learned a whole lot of different, you know, things about networking styles, topologies, yeah. everything like that. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting experience. And then, then I started getting uh, more with like a, a ISDN. I'd never been exposed to ISDN really, except in what was in the books, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, does anybody really even use this anymore? Yeah, because this uh, would have been 2006. Yeah, with ISDN, when really, you, yeah. Mastercard yeah, yeah. used to be very big on uh, ISDN huh. uh, for their backups and everything, just because you know everybody, you know, we we have to process credit card payments, oh, yeah. and um, the uh, so they used to use that as a backup mechanism. Mm -hmm. So if their primary went down, it Bloop, dialer would pop up and right, okay. you know, ISDM would go. And uh, so that, that was interesting to, to learn about. And, and even now, I mean, there, there are some countries out there yeah. where ISDN is a means for some people to uh, provide connectivity. Yeah, um, okay. yeah I've, I've, I've seen it a few times <laughs> in, in the past, you know, like three years. So um, it's not dead yet. Yeah. Uh, but the... Uh, yeah, at t was a very interesting experience because uh, eventually they merged our group and the managed network services, managed router services, 
And uh, so then I started getting introduced to VoIP and, and yeah. everything else like that. Um, it got a lot more, so I'd already been doing it in the military some, you know, yeah. configuring call manager and dropping phones and, and stuff like that. But uh, got a much more uh, dealing with dial peers and stuff like that yeah. on, on the router itself. So called like call manager express type setups and yeah. everything that um, wider breadth yeah. of knowledge. Yeah. And, um, and I enjoyed that, you know, I just kind of soak all that stuff up like a sponge. Uh, security became yeah. a big thing as well. And um, so it was very So did you get to, to, to do a lot of things? Because that's one of the big complaints once you go to a company, especially the size mm -hmm. of AT&T, is you really do become a cog. It's like yeah. those people that you do GPOs and that's like, that's so, all you do. <laughs> so I would say, I would say probably about 60 to 70 percent of the problems yeah. that, that arose most of the time was some kind of circuit issue, right? Yeah. So the AT&T provided service because we were doing managed services, managed router services, you know, yeah. stuff like that. So it was an AT&T router with an AT&T circuit or, you know, maybe a different last mile provider or something like that. And the circuit would go down, the site would become isolated and, and that was it. You know, 60, 70% of the time, that's what the problem was. Yeah. Um, or some kind of core outage somewhere, you know. And so we didn't really get involved with that. The rest of the time, though, you know, yeah. was you deploying a new, excuse me, uh, router, you know, deploying a new switch or making some configurations on the network and, yeah. and other stuff like that. Troubleshooting, you know, errors on the line, you know. Okay. And so w there was a lot of other things that we, we had to get into yeah. as well, you know. And um, the nice thing about being so many problems, <laughs> nice thing about problems with circuits. Yeah. Um, was the fact that it allowed us to devote a lot more time because it, most of the time it was very obvious, okay, this is a circuit issue, right? Mm -hmm. Or there, there's power problem at the site. Um, so we got to focus a lot more of our time on, on the other problems. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me a lot of time to read and understand mm -hmm. what was going on. And, and uh, AT&T also provided training on stuff. That's where mm -hmm. I got introduced to uh, Juniper, you know, mm -hmm. learning with Junos and, and everything with their switches and routers and their WAN acceleration products and yeah. stuff. So uh, it wasn't just Cisco, yeah. uh, <laughs> and um, so a lot of lot of good exposure there. So it it, it depend working for a big company can yeah. be good and it can be bad. It just depends yeah. where you land at. That's why it's always key to ask a lot of questions in yeah. the interview to figure out to get a better explanation of what you'll be doing. Because a lot of times you'll see the the uh, um, uh, job explanation. I'll say, you need to be able to do this or be familiar with this. Well, what does it mean exactly that I have to be familiar with TCP IP? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of a given if you're yeah. going to be in a network engineer position. Well, why yeah, exactly yeah. do I, I need to know this, you know? And, um, yeah, they always want to put these innocuous statements on there. You'd be familiar with this. And, yeah, yeah. okay, I don't understand why. You know, so tell me, explain to me exactly what my normal day, that's an awesome interview question. Yeah, yeah. You'd ask the interviewer, what would my normal day to day be? Yeah. You know, so, and then ask for an abnormal version of that. And, yeah. and you probably get a pretty good feel for, for what you're going to be doing. And then, so once you're in AT&T, like if you had just stayed with AT&T, the argument is always like certifications is good for getting jobs. So when you mm -hmm. leave AT&T, you want as much paperwork as possible. But if they're giving you training, mm -hmm. do, you, do you need papers to move up in a company, do you think? <sighs> eh, buy them, yes yeah. and no. Yes and no. Um, so always there's the performance aspect. Obviously, if you're performing above your peers, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to get looked at sooner for promotion or, you know, lateral transfers or, you know, management positions, all that good stuff if you're interested in that. Yeah. Um, sometimes, though, you might have somebody that is just as good as you are or yeah. close yeah. or may, and, and maybe that person has a better rapport with the manager than, yeah. than you do, you know. Yeah. Um, the, I, I've always been a little too direct for some people, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not afraid to uh, tell it how it is, and I don't like to sugarcoat things. Tact is not my yeah. strong point. <laughs> and um, so I always, always had to set myself apart. Yeah. So certifications is one way to do that, you know? And okay. um, so just, I, I'm not huge on certifications. Okay. Um, just from the standpoint, I don't feel like I, if I need to go out and get a certification, yeah. then I'll go out and get a certification. Okay. You know, um, I'm, I'm doing that now. Yeah. And uh, uh, working on my IE and uh, or CCIE, 
Yeah. yeah. And um, the uh, just because I need that for our company, you know, to, okay. to keep doing and have the benefits that we have, I have to get that certification. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with doing that, you yeah. know. But uh, I, I feel I don't need, me personally, I don't yeah. need a certification to tell me that, you know, I'm a good engineer, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you need a way to set yourself apart from the pack, then, again, certification is a good way to do that. And then if you're with a big company like AT&T, so, so give or take, the, the rule of thumb is every two years you should be bouncing, at least up to either from a company to another company or just being promoted uh -huh. if you stick around too long. But the curious question is, is again, if you're dealing with a small company like I&E or you know, smaller things, obviously you need to bounce in order to get more experience. Right. But if you're someplace like AT&T, which obviously they have a huge number of opportunities, how long would you feel comfortable staying there before you would think people would start getting worried you're almost there too long? Well, I mean, it just, it <laughs> depends, uh -uh. right? Yeah. So um, I will, I, there were a few guys that I yeah. worked with yeah. um, doing client support and everything yeah. that had been in the same role yeah. for 10 years. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, their idea of advancement was they were getting paid more and they got away with more, you know, <laughs> as in not, not doing as many tickets and, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Their metrics, you know, okay. were, were looked at differently. Yeah. Um, or maybe they took, quote unquote, higher level tickets. <laughs> um, so it, dep it, it depends on your viewpoint. What, what exactly do you mean... Uh, moving yeah, yeah I mean if, if you have a change in responsibilities or you're dealing with higher level you know tickets say in AT&T yeah. um, higher priority or or um, uh, more complex yeah. uh, that that can be seen and you are getting the raise as well I mean yeah. that can be seen as a move because you're increasing in responsibilities okay. um, the the problem there is like you were talking about, the getting exposure to different things. Yeah. Um, I got exposed to a lot of different things, but they were kind of still in that key route switch area with little dabbles here and there and, yeah. and a little bit of voice, a little bit of security. Um, I didn't want that. You yeah. know, that was, that was kind of one. Of, and it was the luckiest thing in the world for me to get hit with the whole recession thing. Really? Um, by, by losing that position, that forced me oh, to really? branch out anymore. And okay. I had never seen myself as a, a specialist. Okay, yeah. But uh, uh, I, I got told by one of the, the old timers there yeah. that I needed to find my specialty. <laughs> that I needed to make myself indisposable uh, in, yeah. in, in uh, that, that specialty, that a way they could never get rid of me. I just kind of ingrain myself <laughs> and be like, well, he's the only guy that knows this, you know, yeah, so yeah. you can't do anything with him. I think that is the biggest load of bull. <laughs> really? uh, the, the whole specialist route is absolutely ridiculous to me huh. when, it, when it comes to networking. Yeah. Granted, yeah. okay. So there are some areas where it's, it's great to have specialists, okay? Yeah. Um, uh, but n networking in general, I yeah. think it's absolutely ridiculous, especially depending on, on your position and what you want to do with your life. Mm. I mean, yeah, so there's this whole whole uh, movement now um, with uh, the full stack engineer, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I've, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, just because of the way all the technologies are converging together yeah. and the way they're starting to work with each other, yeah. um, you can't implement one piece without knowing how some of the other pieces work. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a specialist <laughs> and you just focus on this one part, okay, here's my cable or here's, here's the port for you to plug into, you yeah, know, yeah. I'm done, yeah, right? Yeah. You can't properly make the network play, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the whole specialist thing is, is, uh, is dead. In, in my eyes, so. and that yeah. and that's actually one of my whole whole shticks right now. I've I've been preaching, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the don't be a specialist, be a generalist. Really so. Interesting. And so you say so. I guess AT and T was recession, but just out of mm -hmm. curiosity, how, how often do you think you should be going out for interviews once you already have it? Even if you have a job that you like, like when do you put your thing on a monster again, just to get feelers, even if you don't technically want to leave. You so. I actually got this advice. 
if you have any change in responsibilities yeah. or, or what you're doing at your job, yeah. automatically go out and update your, your LinkedIn or your resume or whatever. <laughs> Keep your resume updated. It should be no more than three to six months out of date. Right, because okay, yeah, yeah. you know, obviously, you never know what's going to happen with a job. You know, the the climate could change. You know, at the yeah. drop of a dime, um, you could get upset with uh, direction the company's taking, or you know, they could lose a bunch of money and fire you and a bunch of other people, or, or whatever. You could do something dumb, <laughs> yeah, lose yeah. your job. Yeah. Um, so it, your resume should never be out of date. <sighs> you know, I, I heard some advice from one of my friends okay. and and he said that even if you're happy yeah. in your job yeah. maybe every six months or so okay. take an interview okay just yeah, to, yeah. just to see what's out there you yeah, know yeah. go search for jobs and 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 see you know what is available to yeah. to where you're at in your skill level mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of times even though you're you're doing you know all these so what i do now is consulting right yeah. so I, I lots of different exposure to technologies and stuff but uh, you know they there may be a, a need or a call for a certain area somewhere that maybe you're not as strong in yeah. and taking an interview is kind of justification if you need any to mm -hmm. to go out and and research that you know yeah, okay. and um, so and it also lets you know what other companies are, are thinking about as far as what they need for engineers. Yeah. So I, I'd say, you know, just, just for the hell of it, you know, every, every six months or so, go out, take an interview and, and, and see what happens. And who knows? Yeah. I mean, you might come across your absolute dream job yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you uh, interviewed for it and now you're better off than you were. I mean, you know, things have a tendency of dropping in your lap sometimes. Well, I guess that's a thing is because I haven't been an employee for so long now, but <laughs> oh. back when I was like monster was still new and all that. And so a lot of people worried about getting blacklisted because it wasn't as normal that resumes were simply posted 24 seven. The idea was you post your resume when you want a job, you yeah. take it. And so the problem was, is if your HR person was looking for a new employee uh -huh. and then saw your resume, then, then bad things would happen. Yeah. Welcome to the age of LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so, so with taking interviews now, in general, do you think you could get blacklisted? Do you think that could cause you problems with the company that you're currently at? It depends on your company. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, generally speaking, I, I, I don't think so, no, no that, okay. that, that would happen. But if you have a very vindictive HR or manager <laughs> yeah. or something and, and, and something comes back to them, you know, it, Possibility. I mean, I'm not going to 100% say no. That would never happen because yeah, yeah. you know there's, you know, dumb people out there. <laughs> <laughs> not so nice. Yeah. Um, and uh, the yeah. So you can't say it's not going to 100% happen. Yeah. But on the converse side of that, let's say that your HR department does find out that you're shopping for a new job yeah. and it does get back to your boss. Yeah. Depending on the type of employee you are, yeah. um, that might be a good thing. You know, <laughs> they, they might be like, oh, well, maybe we should see about uh, reconsidering that uh, raise or let's go back and look at his performance okay. and uh, or her um, yeah. and <laughs> and uh, and see what's what's going on with them. You know, okay. is there a reason why they're not so happy yeah. or, or looking for another job? So, you know, and then because you have a few jobs after this. So, yeah. Because again, one of the the, the 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 problems that people have, especially with the six month mark, if they're not looking truly looking for work, is the question of is do you have to do do you find you have to do interviews but in nine, the nine to five schedule, or will people meet with you at six or seven or whatever? Uh, it depends on how hard up they are. <laughs> ah, there you go. Um, it, and and also because of of the way HR departments and stuff work nowadays, mm. and how spread out. All the different you know companies are yeah. you may be interviewing for a position that's local yeah. but your manager may be on the west coast hmm, so you might be able to interview after hours um yeah, there's okay. i see a lot I, I i get a lot of linkedin mails and and yeah. stuff like that you know soliciting for you know interviews and and everything that you know they're willing to do skype interview you know or mm -hmm. yeah and so they would give me a time one's good time for you and oh, okay. you know stuff like that so the uh um i i think and even if you have to do it nine to five i yeah. mean you got your lunch break if you can do it over skype yeah. 
Yeah, you know, okay. then okay. Yeah, then yeah. you just hold your phone up and talk like that. So, <laughs> okay. you know, or tablet or or, or however. So, yeah. um, because the technology is there now, it doesn't have to interfere as much as it once did, where you gotta dress up in your suit and drive across yeah. town and yeah. wait, you know, until you can get in to see the guy and then yeah. do you know your hour long, sometimes longer interview. I've had longer, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and then you know pop smoke and try to get back to your office. So, so, so like, so telephone and Skype interviews, mm -hmm. these, these are more normal. Cause again, back when I was an employee, you might get it, but it was really weird yeah. and far between. So now doing like a Skype interview is a more mm -hmm. normal thing to do then. Oh yeah, most definitely. Actually, so my, my AT&T interview that yeah. I did was, was over the phone. Really? Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. I did an over the phone interview for that and for uh, the uh, CenturyTel job. Yeah. Both of them were, were over the phone. They made allowances since I was located in um, Kentucky yeah. because that's where I was stationed at uh, um, Fort Campbell. And uh, so they made allowances to do telephone interviews and everything. Yeah. It's, it depends on the situation. If you have a have a good HR person or you know yeah. some whoever's looking, you know they can make a lot of allowances. But yeah, I think that's really the norm nowadays yeah. okay. with with telephone and, and Skype just because. You know, you get a lot of remote positions now too. That, yeah. That's that's a big thing. <laughs> uh, the uh, the ability to you know work at a position that's based in Colorado or something and, yeah. and stay here in the Triangle or whatever. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, they they want to you know I think that FaceTime is a key thing though. Everybody yeah. really wants to see the see the other person's face and reaction and yeah. and make sure if they're asking technical questions or you're not sitting there with a book and <laughs> going, ah, oh, it's here somewhere. So. so that's a curious thing, like talking about the remote work, because um, remote work has come up so much. And once you get further in, in your career and you know what, you actually know what you want, you know, whether you do remote or uh -huh. in person is your own thing. But when you're still new in your career, let's say you're in the two or three year mark, how do, how do you consider remote work? You know, because there's a lot of that question. Oh, I, I would never, never, <laughs> and never, oh, okay. never. It takes, a, especially if you are going to, for a 100% remote position, yeah, yeah. it takes a special individual. Oh, wow. It takes a very special <laughs> individual because, I mean, so you're working at your house. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can roll out of bed in your underwear and put on your slippers and walk into whatever room you're using as your office yeah, yeah. And, and start working, right? Yeah, yeah. And the distractions in your own home yeah. um, that are possible, I mean, <laughs> it, it takes a very special individual. Even now, I mean, as far, far along in my career as I am, yeah, yeah. I, I find it very tough to work from home. Really? Just because, okay. well, so I've got, you know, I'm married, I've got four kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, my youngest is, is uh, three. So he's, okay, he yeah. doesn't go off to school or anything. My, my older three are, are in school, so they're mm -hmm. gone during the day. But just with my three-year-old and my wife in the house, <laughs> you know, and, and my wife has gotten much better about it than, than she was, yeah. you know, about not bothering me if I'm working from home because technically I'm at work, right? <laughs> yeah, so you yeah. can't ask me to come do a load of dishes. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, yeah, I got a conference call coming up. Um, but my three-year-old does not get the idea. So yeah. all of a sudden he's busting up in the room. I'm on a call with a client or somebody. Daddy! And, yeah. you know, they're like, what's that sound? Oh, nothing. You get out. <laughs> so um, it, it, it takes a very special individual, good environment that you yeah. have to set up, you know, so you can keep yourself focused on the job at hand. So, I mean, if you have like rock steady nerves and focus and determination and stuff, yeah. okay, go yeah. for it. But if yeah. you have any question about your capability of working from home, yeah. don't do it. Don't, do it, don't take a 100% remote work because you will get yourself in trouble. I guarantee it may not be within the first month or two, but yeah. there will come a time where you're going to wake up and be like, I know I'm supposed to be working, but I'm going to go on a Netflix binge. And, and next thing you know, you've got you know emails piled up and, yeah. and work piled up and your boss is saying, why isn't this done? And yeah. you're like, uh, Daredevil was new episodes. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. So, so, I, that, that's yeah. just my, my wow. two cents on, yeah, on okay. the thing. And some people may disagree, but I, I just I think early in your career it is a bad idea to to aim for a 100% remote job unless you're that that special individual. So do you think you can if you are that special individual, 
Do you think it'll hurt your advancement? Because that's one thing, like, if you're not around to schmooze with people, I always believe in office politics and schmoozing. Do you think it'll matter? Mm, well, I mean, you can schmooze, schmooze over the phone and, and via uh, email and stuff. Uh, a lot of these remote positions require you to, to travel occasionally, like uh, maybe come into the, the mothership, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, say hello. But um, the, uh, no, I, I don't think it, it hurts for advancement. Um, I, I, I think it may hurt your skill set some. Um, okay. Just because a lot of these remote positions are specialized <laughs> positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you see what I did there? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, and so they're looking for very key individuals to, to do this certain kind of work. And, and a lot of time it, it turns out to be contract work anyway. Hmm. Um, but uh, th there are some, some full-time positions you know, with the company doing remote work. But uh, again, sometimes it requires a lot of travel. You yeah, know, so okay. it's you're traveling <laughs> and being able to work from home when you're home. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. So you're at AT and T. You did all that stuff, but then you were a Cisco Networking Academy instructor oh, at the pub. Oh, really? <laughs> I, 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 I did not expect that reaction. No. Either. So okay. no, no. <laughs> I love teaching. Okay. I, I absolutely love sharing knowledge and stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the the best times that I had was when I was in the military was was teaching my soldiers stuff about, about the switches and, and doing yeah. training exercises and stuff like that. And I thought this was a great idea to do. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Uh, working in the public school sector, a yeah. lot of politics. Huh, really? Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> politics. Um, when you have a bunch of students fail yeah, yeah, a yeah. test yep. that is supposed to allow them to get a voucher to get Cisco certified, okay, yeah. and they tell you to pass those people, Eesh. or to grade on a curve yeah. to allow a larger amount of people to pass, okay, yeah. um, so they can get those vouchers and it can look on paper that it was a success. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm not going to do that yeah, okay. um, because obviously, okay, so you're at the school and it says you passed a test that's comparable to what you would get if you went to go get certified, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if they went and took that voucher that yeah. they had gotten to go get certified yeah. and then they fail and everybody's gonna be like, well, you passed it here, why didn't you get it there? Yeah. Well, it's because teacher graded on a scale yeah. and I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I walked out after. You walked I was, out. I walked out after I was told to, to do that. So um, yeah. So curious though, so you were actually with the school system. I was actually a teacher for the school system, yes. So then, I mean, because you had your military experience, you had your AT&T stuff and all that. Was it, was it actually a viable job? Because, I mean, that's the whole argument. Is uh, that there's you're no... starting to get into this dangerous minds thing, right? <laughs> you know, remember, remember the movie with Michelle Pfeiffer where she was the teacher and the... Yeah. Oh, I do. I no, no, that. no. And it was so. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, like, is it, you know, like when you think, of, is there the money and the benefits? Was it really <sighs> worth? I mean, if, if it hadn't gone sideways. If it hadn't gone sideways, yes. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it would have, the money wouldn't have been what, what I would have been making private sector. Yeah. But because of my love of teaching, yeah. sharing knowledge, um, and the additional free time that I would have had to pursue other avenues of technology on my own. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I think it would have been viable for myself. I mean, get, don't get me wrong, the money's nice. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. But it, the, the, the key thing for me is technology and sharing that information. Okay. And if you get a bunch of young minds that are interested yeah, yeah. In, in the program, you know, that's one thing. But yeah. when you get kids shoved into the class because they want to fill it yeah. and they didn't have any other place to put them, then you're getting into a realm where you've got 60 kids and only eight of them want to actually learn the technology. Really? So, so they would do that? Because I, well, I, 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 can't, I can't imagine taking a bored 16-year-old and trying to teach them Cisco. Like trying to teach they, them they English put, is bad yeah, enough. They, they put no pre, uh, prerequisites for the class. Really? They have networking 101 classes in, in the school system at the high schools. and so okay. They didn't even put that as a prerequisite. Really? Anybody who wanted to sign up to go into it could go into it. Yeah. So you had those legitimate kids that were interested in learning yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But um, they, yeah, then you had the other kids that they didn't know what to do with them. You know, from from their homeschools, because where where this was at was mm -hmm. a a uh, academy that um, well not an academy. It was a school that was more for professional 
uh, development because the, the whole idea was was not every kid's going to go to college directly after high school. Yeah. You know, they may need a viable job option to support themselves or their family or anything like that, or to put themselves through school. Yeah, yeah. And um, I thought, hey, you know, that's 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 a cool thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they had a lot of different things there. They had barbering and right. small engine repair. Yeah. You know, uh, small business administration. Um, Vi uh, scientific visualization, which is hmm. basically working with graphics and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, and and then they had the the Cisco networking, and um, but they again no prerequisites, <laughs> so they were trying to put as many bodies into this new school as they could. Yeah. So they were taking the kids that weren't going to pass, otherwise if they didn't have the extra credits, yeah, yeah. and. Yeah, I hope I don't get a lawsuit from <laughs> public schools. But yeah, so they were taking these kids from their home school and then busing them to this school so they could get yeah. those additional credits and graduate. Yeah. And so they were just slapping into whatever class. So you had a lot of disruptive kids hmm. in, in these classes, kids who were known troublemakers and stuff like that. And in the Cisco class. In in, in the Cisco I had one <laughs> class I had <laughs> I had one kid that was was constantly um, uh, causing problems yeah. would get up and walk out and walk yeah. back in wouldn't listen and and just you know talking to other people wouldn't do his classwork or anything like that I mean yeah. and I'm like so I tried to find out what the deal with this kid was and he was a known troublemaker at, at his at his home school and they <laughs> so yeah um, it was an interesting experience it was a learning experience um, so then why did you spend so one year one year eight months was that basically two two years for them or did you just walk out of the middle of class one no 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 <laughs> um actually i think that might be a, a typo on the uh, on the time frame because yeah. that was actually just one school oh just school, one school year yeah, yeah. yeah. um I, I guess maybe the uh yeah 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 so, I, I think <laughs> i, I might have got the the time <laughs> frame wrong I'm, I'm putting that in yeah no it was just one school year that i did it I started, built the lab, yeah. you know, did all the coursework and everything for them, and gave it to them. And at the end of the school year, when they did the the EOGs, EOCs, or whatever you want to call it, and yeah. they uh, a bunch of them didn't pass. The principal was like, "Great on a curve," yeah. um, and I'm like, "No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you do it. I'm not no, doing it," no. and I left. So um, that's it. So with that then, because one of the things that I get with a lot of my viewers is they go through these academies and then they somehow think that there's going to be a good job at the other side. 18 year olds, 18 years old, graduate of the Cisco <clears throat> Academy. Yeah, and, and they even get their CCNA. They're even yeah. like, I got the real piece of paper. What, like, okay, let's say you go through this. Let's say you're one of the eight kids that actually pays attention. You get your CCNA, you're 18 years old. What does this actually do for you? Um, it sets you apart from the other 18 year olds that want to get a 15 or 20 hour, dollar an hour job. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Can you get a 15 or 20 dollar an hour job with this as an 18 year old? Yeah. Really? I think so? Yeah, okay. I think so, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think there are enough openings at, at, at a bunch of, especially if you're willing to do the contract work. Yeah, and stuff, okay, yeah. you know, because um, a lot of these, play, just like, uh, you know, these low-level call centers or customer support and you know, stuff like that, they, mm. they need bodies and seats. Yeah, okay. They need people to answer the phone. And um, I mean, so yeah, you can get that, and, and that's where it comes into play, right? Yeah. So if you're an 18, 19-year-old kid yeah. and you've got the Cisco certificate and you're going into a call center to do, you know, level zero, level one support, yeah. right? And you have that CCNA. Let's say you do that job for a year yeah. or two years. Okay. Now you've got experience yeah. and a CCNA. Yeah, 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 then yeah. Okay. that's when you start shopping around. But I think the important thing here, <laughs> though, so you have your CCNA and you're still going into a call center. You're yeah, not, you're not CCNA going no. into a data center. No, you are not CCNA. <laughs> oh well, I you can run a like rack and stack jobs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're not, just because you have a CCNA, you are mm. not going to end up being, you know, super duper network engineer extraordinaire mm. okay. making $90,000 a year. Not yeah. going to happen okay. at, at all. Yeah. Unless you are one lucky, lucky individual that, yeah. you know, managed to pull off some kind of black magic doo-doo. No. Uh, 
<laughs> so yeah, you're you're not. You, you can get a good job for yeah. for an 18 19 year old kid you're yeah. going to get a really good job yeah, yeah. you know but you're going to need that certification along with that exp experience is the big thing yeah, right yeah, okay. uh, i mean i i could i could I, my kid okay yeah, yeah. is smart enough that if i brain dumped him yeah. you know he could go take the ccna exam and pass Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. but just because he has that CCNA yeah. doesn't mean he can do all these things. Yeah. All right, it's the experience is the key thing. So that's what you have. You know, everybody needs to keep in mind. Yeah. If you don't have that experience with all all the gear and, and doing the commands over and over and over again, because that's yeah. what it is, very <laughs> repetitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, if you don't have that experience, you're you're not going to get anywhere. Okay. You know that that piece of paper, you might as well set it on fire and throw the ashes into the air. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so that's one thing too is with the, the kids coming out now because it's really weird. Like people don't understand how the dynamic has changed in a relatively short period of time, fifteen years. And so what I always talk about was I, I was a twenty three year old. I was dealing with half million dollar build outs. I was dealing with a lot of stuff that there was no way in hell I would ever hire a twenty three year old to do simply because I was the only person dumb enough to do it. Yeah. So I guess, but that's one thing like a lot of people don't realize is that time has changed. So if you're young, if you're 18 or 19, there's all the stories about our generation who went out there and we were able to do all this mm -hmm. stuff because there was nobody else to do it. Reasonably now, how many years experience before you start to do something that's probably pretty cool? You know, five years, 10 years, can you really do anything cool in two years? In two years? Probably not unless you're a rock star. Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. there there are those those rare individuals out there that you know in the two years that they've been working that you know low level support, they've been reading those books, they've been yeah. you know going after that that CCNP level, you know for you know just that's generalized, not necessarily Cisco. I'm just <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. everybody knows what I'm talking. About. But they're, they're going for that that professional level of knowledge as opposed to that associate level knowledge. Yeah. And and so they're and th those guys are rock stars, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that's the abnormal. I'd say within three to five years, yeah. you might get pulled onto a team that's doing something cool. Hmm. Um, if you do well at that, after that five year period, you might actually be leading a team that yeah, that's okay. doing the cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that that key mark is right around that five year period yeah, okay. where where cool things begin to happen as long as you, know, you have that demonstrable level of skill, yeah. uh, that, that level of knowledge. So, uh, yeah. And then, then I guess with that too, I mean, oh, I don't want to get you into trouble, but in, <laughs> inherent, like would you inherently trust a 20 year old? Like, cause that's the thing, we have a lot of young people and with programming, like if you're in the startup world, they're, they're, they, they are where we were, where you can be a 19 year old making 150 a year, yeah. doing amazing things. In IT, in networking, are you really going to trust the 20 year old? It depends on the 20 year old. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that's why that, that FaceTime yeah. interview you know, comes into play. I mean, you don't get a lot of the, the, the knowledge from just hearing somebody's voice, yeah, okay. right? You can kind of get a little bit from it, yeah. but actually seeing that person interact face to face, whether it's through a screen or meeting them in person, you know, you get that uh, that that one-on-one -on -one level, and you can actually see, yeah. you know, how they react to things, and uh, it would be a special twenty-year-old 20 <laughs> that I would trust to, to to do some of the stuff. But I I, I can't say that I would never yeah. trust a twenty-year-old, you okay. know, because I'm sure there's some out there, yeah, you yeah. know. But generally speaking, you know, the the twenty-year-old. Guys will probably be getting the scut work. Go pick up all those yeah. routers. You know, go rack that 6800. <laughs> well, so. I, I guess that brings the question though, because you talk about like certifications versus mm -hmm. education. And again, when you start talking to 30, like people that are like 30 years old, and there's also there's just a respect for you being a little older. Yeah. So certification, a lot of people. But like, I, I guess I would argue, you know, just question with you is like with your kid. Would it be worth it to go through college for four years in some ways just to gain maturity? Yes. Like, yeah, you can get a job at 18, but what's it going to be? Why don't you go through four years of school, get some maturity education? I mean, is that... So uh, here's, here's the thing about college, yeah. right? Um, college really 
hones you okay. for a certain way of thinking. <laughs> depending okay. on, well, <laughs> depending on what kind of degree you get. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and what kind of activities you're doing at college. Yeah, college teaches so many soft skills, right? right yeah, yeah. Just the, the way to study. I mean, so if you're going in, into IT, right, mm -hmm. you just can't expect things to just happen and learn this knowledge by osmosis. Obviously, to keep up to date on technology, we have to read, we have to train, we have to you know, do all, all these things. And you don't just magically know how to do those things just because you're an engineer. Yeah. Um, yeah, or, or any type, kind of IT specialist. Um, the, uh, you have to um, train your soft skills in yeah. addition to your hard skills. And, and college is very good about that. You know, yeah. I finished up my degree while I was in the military. Okay. And um, the, uh, but I, I got it, yeah, right? Yeah. So I, that, that's something I, I felt I needed to do. Yeah. Um, and I, and I've, I've told my kids, I was like, look, you're gonna go to college. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? You're uh, gonna uh, go yeah. to college. Oh, yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as smart as you think you are, yeah, or yeah. you plan on being, or whatever you <laughs> plan to do, yeah. you're gonna go to school for it. My my youngest girl, she she wants to be a, a dancer when she grows up. You're gonna go to college, <laughs> yeah, okay. you know. But you, I don't have to. I want to go to Broadway, yeah. and I'm like, you're gonna go to college. <laughs> So it, it, it's just you, you pick up additional, in addition to whatever it is you're trying to learn at college, yeah. it's those extra soft skills that, that really make the difference. And, okay. and, and that's why there's, there's so many IT guys that I run across yeah. that actually have like you know, some kind of liberal arts degree or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because they learn those, those awesome research oh, soft skills. I, I, know, I know one guy that um, was a... Uh, and MP, and last time I talked to him, he was he was working on his IE. He was a few years older than me. He had a history degree. Huh, okay. And, yeah. and he was he was a, a network engineer, yeah, you know, yeah. and he was working on getting his, his IE. That's a lot of studying right there to be a, a history major. Yeah. You know. So um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 those skills that you get from from doing that. So I would okay. say, yes, go to yes, college, so do good. that. I mean, and, and the, the awesome thing to do would yeah. be to work yeah, well, while you're in college. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then all of a sudden you get done and you've got four year of his, years of experience and a college degree and yeah. you're light years ahead of the game right there. So. so then you got your computer science degree. Yes. So with where you're at now, which is curious because you're IT, CCIE, so computer science isn't really... <laughs> Like people don't realize, I mean, yeah, but nah. um, so is that the same, would you do that degree, if you, if you knew the direction you were going to end up going, would you still have done computer science or would you have gone IS? Well, so when, when I w was doing my, because I did all my stuff online, you know, oh, okay. um, there weren't really any networking really? degrees online hmm. at that time frame. It was really starting to become a thing, but there were no yeah. available programs for me to do yeah. uh, for that. So, I mean, maybe, probably I would have gotten a degree that, you know, if it was available, yeah, yeah. that was associated with, with networking somehow. But because of the CS degree, yeah. the computer science degree, um, that allows me additional levels of knowledge and, mm -hmm. and, and dabbling in areas that you wouldn't necessarily you know, dabbling. So a, a lot of engineers nowadays, you know, like to play with Python or yeah, yeah. You know, have a little bit of knowledge of scripting and stuff like that, just so they can you know, write some rudimentary scripts to, to yeah, yeah. automate, you know, things, you know, because it's, it, you have, you know, 200 devices you need to push configs <laughs> up to. You don't want to log yeah. into 200 different devices and do it. Yeah. So, you know, being able to write a basic shell, shell script or something to do that, that, yeah. you know, awesome, right? Yeah. Um, but the, the level of advancement of the different things you can do, um, working with the APIs from different uh, yeah. companies and vendors and stuff like that, if you know how to actually like do clean code, yeah. um, fantastic. So I mean, okay. it, it helped me in, in the long run, so I'm yeah. happy I, I was, uh, actually went that direction. Yeah. But um, it, it all depends on, on what you want to do, so. Yeah. And then, so you're saying you got an online degree. Yeah. So how do you feel about an online degree? As long as it's from a reputable school, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't want to get uh, a computer science degree from, 
Jack's Crosstown College, you know, that's been in business for two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if it's a reputable school that has their own campuses, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I think that's the key thing, right? Yeah, right. right there. If they are all online, yeah, yeah. if you couldn't go to wherever their headquarters is at and take a class there, yeah. you probably shouldn't do it. Yeah, um, so just because I, I, I think that's a key thing yeah. um yeah <laughs> that if they don't have classes that you can yeah. physically take if yeah. it's all online there might be some question of whether of how legitimate that they are you know yeah. so um like the uni i know a lot of people that have done university of phoenix yeah. uh grantham's a big one um who are some of the the other ones um i can't even remember off the top of my head yeah. who some of the other ones are but uh, yeah, there, there's there's quite a few of them nowadays, and and a lot of them work with the military. Uh -huh. American Military University, I think, is another big one. So um, how would you, especially at the level you're at, because like it's like you say, University of Phoenix, and I snigger a little bit. Um, <laughs> like when you say like Grantham University, yeah. no offense to Grantham, I've never heard of it before. I guess that's one of the questions: yeah. is how the hell do you know if it's reputable? You know. <laughs> well, so I was I was lucky enough that. Um, I was able to go through the military okay, and yeah. they would give me information about the schools and, yeah, yeah. and because they were getting payouts from the VA or, or from, from the, oh, sorry, for the, uh, the army tuition yeah, assistance, yeah. Yeah. They, they had to be certified okay. through them to be able, eligible to get payments. So yeah. I, I, I kind of got the jump up okay. on, on that. The, yeah. You know, the army did all the legwork for me there. Okay. Um, but the, uh, if you're just your, you know, everyday guy and you don't, you know, know anything, yeah. research. I mean, that's that's really the the only thing that you you can do is is to to research it. You know, mm -hmm. hop online. Google is your friend. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, yeah. Is is there anyone? Because again, one of the big questions <laughs> I get from people, you know, is there a special university? Is there like the Yale of IT? I don't know. <laughs> I, I have I have absolutely no clue no, no, in, okay. in that realm. I, I will tell you that a lot of the community colleges yeah, yeah. have have pretty solid IT based, you know, like yeah. two year programs, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. In and out. Um, don't do IT university or my computer class. Oh, no, I just those, started hearing that. Those, yeah, those yeah. guys. Yeah. I, I, I tell you what, um, I, I knew someone that was going to go uh, take classes from there because they wanted to. They wanted to retrain from what they were doing. They were, um, they were like a mover or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, he was like, "Yeah, I'm going to go to my computer class," you know. And uh, and take all those classes there and everything and you know they've got a payment plan and and yeah. all that. I, I think it came out to be for an 18 month you know program to to learn about Cisco and a bunch of other stuff. It was like some ridiculous amount of money, like yeah. fifteen twenty thousand dollars or something. And yeah. I'm like, why are you going to be paying <laughs> that? You can go to the community college and t do a two year course yeah. for couple grand yeah, if that you yeah, know yeah. and um it, it, it even turn around and and doing self-taught if if that's what you wanted to do yeah. but um yeah um i don't know yeah. I, I don't <laughs> think there's a a yale or harvard of of yeah. it universities Good that question so right now you're going for the cie <clears throat> the ccie yeah you haven't done your master's yet. How do you feel about the master's? Is that personal preference? You just don't think it's valuable? Personal preference. Okay. I, I mean, some people, for advancement in their company and stuff, you yeah. know, they may need the master's degree to, to go after it and everything. But, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a necessary thing. I don't yeah, need okay. any kind of master's in business administration. I'm not running a business. Okay. I have no desire to run a business. <laughs> okay. um, and so, and, or I don't need a master's in, in IT infrastructure, or whatever weird ones that they have now. I yeah. think the information systems, I think yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah um, I, I think that just kind of sounds silly not to really. me personally. Um, it, it, and it might be for some people. Some people yeah. feel that they might need that distinction, especially if they work at some of the bigger companies. Yeah, yeah. That's that's one of the big things where it's so hard to get noticed, yeah, yeah. right, for those promotions and stuff. Um, they may need to get master's degrees okay. and, and everything. My uh, 
my dad and my stepmom uh, went and got their master's degree very late in, in life. Huh, yeah. And um, they, they got their master's degrees just so they could get bumps and pay grades. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, you know, so that's, that's one of the things. You may need to do that depending on where you're working. But I think overall, no, it's not necessary. Yeah, okay, it's a college degree, not necessarily a master's. Yeah. So I see, so, so when you went to the public school, you were in the Durham. Mm -hmm. So wh where did you finish serving your military in? Where did you no, do I got out in, uh, I was at Port Campbell. Fort Campbell. So we were in Kentucky. At Kentucky, the time. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then what was it a decision to come here? Yes. Was it AT and so what was your decision to come to this area then? Well no 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 it was AT and T. I oh, mean okay. they yeah, yeah. they were the first I mean we were gonna end up in Louisiana, which oh, okay. at first I was hoping for Louisiana because really? I'm originally from Texas. Okay. And um, so I was like, Yeah, 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 Louisiana, yeah. Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. And um, the uh, but AT and T came through first and uh, it was actually funny. We got moved in down here and on the very uh, day that I got, uh, I was getting ready to start work, I think yeah. about an hour after I started at AT&T, yeah. my first day there, um, I got a call yeah. from, from CenturyTel saying, hey, uh, we've got our offer together. Oh. Um, you want to do a verbal and then we'll yeah. mail you over the, yeah. the letter. And I'm yeah. like, I just started my new job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, it, yeah, that, but that's what brought us down here. I had absolutely no clue how big into tech yeah. RTP was. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, no clue that the triangle was so saturated with yeah. technology companies. So as an, I, as an IT professional now, I mean, <clears throat> Do you think this is a good area to be in? I mean, would you would oh. you leave willing? Like, are you like, eh, I've got a job, so I'm staying. But if I go to Austin, I would go. I mean, is there? It would take the right offer. Okay. Yeah. For me to to move to Texas yeah. with, with my family, because yeah. I mean, we've been in the area for it'll be ten years in the fall. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, the uh, so we're we're pretty, yeah, yeah. you know, rooted here now. Uh, all kids, all have friends and everything. But as far as the area goes for jobs, I mean, it's so rich in jobs. It really is. I mean, and with all the different companies and stuff, I mean, <laughs> say, yeah, I, yeah. I, it would be, uh, Austin would be a good area in Texas to go to, as yeah. well as Dallas is, is, is another, you know, good one. Um, I, I think those are some of the biggest, probably the five, at least in my opinion, the yeah. five biggest areas that you could you could go to are in like the San Jose, Silicon Valley area, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Austin, Dallas, here in yeah. Boston, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, as far as Metroplex area goes, mm -hmm. um, those lot of technology companies all centered around uh, th those different areas. So, so if you were a noob, you were just starting out. Would this would this be like the LA for for noobs in tech? Like, should you just? Come here, get a pizza delivery job, and see if you can make it. See if you can make it as an you know, IT professional. Um, here or in Texas would probably be better options yeah, okay. because of cost of living. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay. I would not want to be a, a newbie trying yeah. to break into the tech field, <laughs> having to pay what it costs to live up in Boston or out in California. Yeah, yeah. Never California. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Take. Take a job in California after you're already in, and, yeah. and you're able to make the money that it takes to live in California. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the uh, yeah, it's, it'd be a, a pretty good area to, to break into the field. So how how would you do that here? Because like in a lot of areas, like if you go to Seattle or if you go to the more normal tech areas, there are a crap ton of meetups. Like if you yeah. if you want to network, you can go five nights a week and never never buy beer or pizza again. Yeah. Um, is it the same way here? Um, is it a little harder to schmooze? Yeah. There are a lot of of technology geek meetups. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are some other um, cloud uh, computing meetups, cloud networking. Um, I actually run one of them, Triangle okay. Network Engineers. Okay. Um, so you could search it on, on meetup.com. But yeah. uh, there are enough that you could get introduced to people okay. in the area um, and, and slowly working your way around. Uh, and uh, one of the other good benefits of being here in the RTP area where yeah. there's so many technology companies are the contract companies, the yeah. consulting yeah. companies, yeah. recruiters abound. 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 <laughs> they yeah. abound. Yeah. Um, they are all over the place. So um, it, 
you would be, it would be pretty, I don't want to say super easy, yeah, yeah. but um, it would be fairly easy to network enough to, I would be highly surprised if you went longer than six months without finding even an entry level yeah. IT position around yeah. here. I mean, I, and I know here and there, are, there are some people who have, your, your mileage may vary, but you know, generally speaking, if, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to go longer than three months without yeah. having somebody want to snatch you up, okay. you know, for if you're willing yeah. to take the job, <laughs> of course, yeah. that's, that, that is a key ca caveat. If, uh, um, you're not willing to take the job or do yeah. the work, then obviously, you know, you're Cinderella and you got to <laughs> have that right, perfect fit glass zipper, slipper. But uh, yeah. yeah. So. so is there any, is there any particular technology that's considered super sexy here? Cause again, it's, it's really interesting. Like oh. the different, the different areas, like, like in Austin, Ruby on rails is like the thing. Like, is there like the thing? Like, Everything. Oh, Everything. Sorry, yeah. Well, I mean, so we've got Cisco around here. We've okay. got EMC. Oh, okay. um, the Cumulus Networks uh, has one of their offices here. So yeah. Cumulus Networks is big into SDN. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so they, they, they have their whole uh, Cumulus Linux that runs on white box switches and, and everything. So, you know, like there, all kinds of stuff. So you can get a job in programming. You know, because IBM has has support structure here, and they have a lot of products, so you can you know code for a product. Yeah. Um, you it, startups pop up around here. You know, yeah. people doing building apps for whatever. Yeah. You know, um, virtually any type of technology position that you could want. Yeah, yeah. You know, they <laughs> RTP is like the Silicon Valley of of the East Coast essentially. I mean, because we yeah. have so many different. Um, once it, it, it's it's all sexy, you know, yeah, okay, it's it, okay, it's yeah. it's all there. I mean, it, whatever kind of technology you're wanting to work with, I mean, yeah. it's here. That's it. Okay, okay. So then, so let's see. Okay, so then you went to you were the instructor for Durham Public School. So uh -huh. then, how did you go from there to CSC? And then and then that's curious. Okay, so you were a network engineer at AT and T, uh -huh. and then you were a senior network engineer at CSC. Yes. How did you get that senior? Because that was the position I was hired for. Is there, okay. there something <laughs> that was, like, that was, I am senior? Okay, now. so yeah, the, the, the senior designation, I always think it's kind of funny. Um, it's a lot of companies use it as like a pay level type thing, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. you know, a grade, not so much a designation of your experience or how good you are. <laughs> yeah. I would not say that I was that good <laughs> yeah. for the senior designation at that point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> um, it, it was, it was the pay level essentially yeah, that, that did it. Okay. Um, and so for what I was making, it was considered senior level. And so that's, that's the designation that I had. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that was, that was a strange job to start off with. Huh, okay. Um, because I was doing a lot of analytics, utilizing NetFlow and, and stuff oh, yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. network monitoring. Um, I, I came up with some automation tasks to kind of streamline that process yeah. uh, for like security things and also monitoring bandwidth usage, make sure there weren't, you know, people doing things on the network they weren't supposed to be doing, like yeah. streaming games was yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. Um, expect, like, you know, now it's March Madness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lots of companies are probably having problems right now uh, because uh, there's games on and, yeah. and uh, they're like, the internet's down. <laughs> no, it's just everyone's streaming a game. Yeah. So um, yeah, st stuff like that. And, okay. and it migrated from there to where, you know, I had a wider range of responsibilities. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what got me in the door yeah. was, was that particular function, utilizing NetFlow and, and doing the analytics portion. Okay. Um, so don't, if you, I needed a job. You need that. Yeah, yeah, I needed a job. That's the next, okay, yeah. And, so. and, and that's kind of what made me go, okay, you know, I, I, need, I need to work, yeah. I need something steady. And, and that's, that, and that's the way it works sometimes, you know, sometimes yeah. you just need that paycheck yeah. and it may not be the ideal job, but it may be the job that gets you the job that you want. Okay. You know, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of 
people are like, oh, well, no, that's not the, the, <laughs> the job that, that I want to do right now. Yeah. And, and it's like, okay, well, no, see, you're focusing on the job that you want after this job, yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. you, but you need the job that you have to have right now to get the job that you want. Yeah. So um, and then that was just kind of thing. And, but because of how good I was, I streamlined yeah. the process so much that what used to take me eight hours yeah. of a word that I'd come in, I'd start correlating all the data, it would take me all day. Yeah. Within a few months, I you know, got it down to, it was just a couple hours of work. And then I would add the data that I would collect throughout the rest of the day yeah. to a final report that yeah. compiled in like 15 minutes. Yeah. So then all of a sudden I have, you know, hours in the rest of the day that I'm like, yeah. you know, give me something else to do. Yeah. And so I started on taking on more responsibility. And that's where I got into a lot of systems work. Hmm, was doing um, DNS administration, yeah. IPAM stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, some more security functions, uh, working with WAN acceleration and switches, yeah. you know, in, in, in the EPA's network. And um, uh, IPv6. Yeah. Oh, this was around about the time that, that the mandate came down from the government that um, at, at least portions of the networks had to be IPv6 huh, uh, uh, compatible. Yeah. Um, you, you could dual stack. You know, yeah, yeah, with yeah. with both four and six, but uh, um, IPv6 had to be there. Yeah. So I, I I got introduced to IPv6 and started working with that. So it, a lot of good things came from because I was willing to take the job that I didn't necessarily want. Yeah. You know, but um, I got a lot of lot of cool exposure that I wouldn't have otherwise had if if you know I'd turned my nose up at it. So. Well, with that, I mean, were you just in a position because you walked from the other job? Is there is there something that you could have done where you think you would have had more options? You wouldn't be stuck with one option? Or is it just kind of the economy at the time? Because it was 2010. The yeah, economy. I mean, the economy was still kind of kind yeah. of tanked. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sure I probably didn't have a glowing recommendation. Um, <laughs> if, if anybody called the, you know, so I, I had talked to the, the technology director who was, was one of my main interfaces at Durham mm. Public Schools. Yeah, the, the principal was technically my boss, but I had a lot of, of um, connection with the technology director. Mm. And um, I told him my reasoning for, for leaving. And, um, you know, a, a lot of time I would put him and her down. <laughs> that way there would be kind of a balanced <laughs> that was, view. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just felt so strongly about it that yeah. I don't think I could have done done anything differently, uh, you know, yeah. from from what I did. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, you, you do what you got to do sometimes. So, oh, so I guess that's one thing. Bring up recommendations. So everybody always <laughs> asks for recommendations, and then I always hate it because I, I like I, I, you know I spend like three days trying to figure out the perfect recommendation. And then nobody ever calls. Yeah. Um, mm. Do you call? Like, have you found people call recommendations? Um, Sometimes. So yeah. it, we, we live in a different day and age than what it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago when, yeah. when people had the reference sheet that was part and parcel of, of their resume. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, uh, you know, you were allowed, if somebody was a scumbag employee, you could say they're a scumbag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. nowadays though, I think there's a lot of laws on the books or been changes or something like that, I think, mm, yeah. where all anybody can ever, because I, I think what had happened is there's probably a lot of lawsuits involved somewhere along the way mm -hmm. where you know somebody actually gave a false yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, reference saying that they were bad when in fact there was nothing wrong with them and they yeah. figured out and then somebody sued somebody else and yeah, yeah whatever. So, you know, I think the, I don't know, if there's not a law, a lot of company policy now says that we can verify their employment. We can't give any character statements now. So a lot of times you have to find someone that is willing to, to actually say things. So if you are going to rely on recommendations, which it's, it's still a thing. Some companies do actually check it. Um, talk to the person before you write them down. Even though if they were your last manager or somebody that you worked with or anything like that, um, talk to them. Tell them that you're gonna be using them as a reference. Make sure you have a good rapport with them before you put them down. You know, I, obviously you don't want somebody that's just gonna say whatever you tell them to say, but um, because it, that's dishonest on a whole other level. <laughs> but, uh, you know, have someone that's actually gonna speak testament to the type of engineer that you are. Um, 
whether it's you're a lazy engineer, yeah. you know, but what, you know, a lot of innovations come about from laziness. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just, you know, yeah. be careful who you write down. Just because it asks for references or anything, don't, I don't think you necessarily have to put down your, your last, you know, yeah, manager okay. or yeah. last boss. You know, a lot of times it can be somebody that you worked with, so. Okay. So then you were only there for 10 months. It says on your resume. Oh, the CSC thing. CSC, yeah. Okay, yeah. So what happened there is actually I was in the same position. Yeah. Another company won the contract that we were on. Oh, weird. From the EPA. So yeah. I switched companies. Okay. So I was actually a contractor to CSC who was a contractor to the EPA. Okay. So I was a subcontractor through a company called Dysis. Yeah. And um, then CGI Federal came in won the contract that CSC was on okay, and yeah. took some of the people and made them full-time employees. Okay. So then I started working for um, CGI Federal. Okay. And, um, and I was doing it was the exact same, same thing. So that, that's curious. I mean, did you run into any weird... Because you don't, you don't think about another company basically kind of... Well, no, in, in situations like this yeah. with the government contracts and stuff, yeah. that happens a whole lot. Really? They move in because, you know, yeah, all right, they bid on the same contract that this other company had been in and everything. Yeah. But they don't have that foundational knowledge, right? So what happens is they'll take some of the key employee, they'll bring in their own pe mm -hmm. people, but they take some of the key employees and, and pull them into their organization. That way they have that foundational knowledge there. Okay. And um, yeah. So. so is there, do you have to go through the entire re renegotiation process or do they normally take you as <laughs> so, is? So, so <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was an interesting um, situation. Uh, <laughs> they, they interviewed, yeah. the, so they came in and they interviewed everybody that worked there. With, with the exception of the CSC managers who chose not to be interviewed, right? No, okay. Some of the managers wanted to stay with CSCs. So they're like, I'm not coming to your interview. No, okay, yeah. um, so they interviewed all the people. They asked what your position was, what it is that you did, what systems you were familiar with, you know, those types of things. And um, I got brought in and they, the next week, they had a bunch of folders. They walked into the office, they had a bunch yeah. of folders and with people's names on them and they handed them out to everybody. Yeah. And um, inside mine was an offer letter, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And this was the first time that I actually had a pay reduction. Mm. Mm. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> so so it, was, it, it was weird though, but I had better benefits. Right. Oh, um, okay. There was some some uh, additional benefits. Their their health care was was a bit better than what I was mm -hmm. getting. Um, they had like some stock purchase employee stock yeah. purchase plans. The four hundred one k was better and stuff like that. But I'd never even even in in moves like that because at AT and T I was a contractor to start with, and then I got brought on FTE. Mm -hmm. I had an in you know better benefits and an increase in pay there. Yeah, yeah. So I had never experienced this this <laughs> flip over before where I'm getting paid less. And they were yeah, like, yeah, yeah, well, based on you know this you know, formula that we have, this is where we feel that you're at. Yeah. And, and, but the position that I was at was senior network engineer, yeah. right? And I'm like, some of the other guys that I know were listed as senior network engineers yeah. aren't getting paid. It, a lot of it had to do yeah. because of their formulas and, mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. And the fact that I wasn't carrying an active certification and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and all that. Um, and because I wasn't in a specialized spot hmm. so my because of what I'd been doing there I was spread out in a lot of areas yeah, yeah. so I touched on a lot of different things that you know every we had like a couple guys that were just route switch you know okay, yeah. and we had a whole security team yeah. and then we had the the systems guy yeah. and I was I was supposed to be they weren't bringing over the main systems guy hmm. I was coming over to do uh, the DN. I was going to be the main DNS administrator. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I was the guy that was actually, you know, listed on whenever you looked up EPA.gov. Yeah. My name was <laughs> under the, the the DNS administrator. But um, so I was the DNS administrator. IPAM. You know, all of those servers in addition yeah. to all these other things that I was doing too. WAN yeah. acceleration, um, the the analytics stuff, and um, it was a uh, it was a weird experience for me. <laughs> um, did you think about um, 
did you think about staying with CS? Was it even an option? Was it like take less pay or get laid off? Or did you have the option? To CS, CS CSC was looking for positions for other people if they if they mm. wanted them, but they weren't guaranteeing uh, anything. Now they guaranteed it for a few people because they immediately had openings with other contracts that they had. Yeah. But not everybody had a guarantee. They would be like, look, you know, we'll we're gonna keep looking to find a position for you, but we obviously can't keep paying you while you're not doing anything. Yeah. So if you want to go home and wait. <laughs> <laughs> until we give you a call that we have something for you that was an option um so and that's the reason why i i, I rolled it and yeah. i didn't like lose a lot but yeah, it was i mean it was it was bucks, it was yeah. a few thousand dollars yeah. less than what other, and i was like this is weird <laughs> uh, weird, yeah. yeah it was it was, it was kind of weird so um so did you like with the it department like with a lot of it departments it's almost funny, like I have to remind so many geeks like that they are actually part of a business. Yeah. Like they think like the server room is somehow the entire world. Uh -huh. right? So when you're working on these federal contracts, as you do you guys realize these con re contract negotiations are coming up? Do you get blindsided by this or is this something that just if you're in that environment you, you understand? You you, you know that these things are happening. Okay, you yeah, yeah. you hear about them as they're coming along, there's memos that go out, you know. The, the the typically from our our point of view we knew that CGI and some of the other companies that were competing for the contract were yeah. coming to the facility where we were located at yeah. because they were telling us to cover stuff up, you know, <laughs> so that yeah. way they couldn't get an idea of what was going on before <laughs> going in there to, mm. to talk about that. So, yeah, okay. the, uh, so yeah. yeah. So you were there then, so you were there for about two years yeah. and then you went over to it's so funny the names of these damn companies. STS. STS. So, so what is what is STS? STS, uh, STS was a contractor to Cisco. So I was actually oh, okay. I worked f uh, at Cisco at the Cisco offices mm -hmm. doing implementations hmm. for Cisco offices. Um, that was an interesting job. So yeah. I was I we worked for Cisco. Yeah in Cisco offices, okay. North and South America. So if they had mm. to upgrade the switches, they had to upgrade the routers on site, install UCS yeah. servers or, or any of this other stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we would get sent on site and, okay. and do all the new config, new phones, new APs, whatever needed to be done yeah. and, and do all. So that, that was awesome, no, okay. right? Yeah, it, yeah. It, so yeah, my, my fourth child was, was born right about the time I started this job. So yeah. that part was not very cool. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, my yeah. wife was very unhappy about that, and that's actually what caused me to leave that position, just because the yeah. amount of travel that was involved with it. Because yeah. basically what would happen is once a quarter, at the beginning of the quarter, yeah. we would uh, be handed a list of, of sites. You know, They, they would get a, a list from, from Cisco Operations, say these are all the sites that need to be checked if yeah. they're in spec and, and and uh, best practices and all the stuff like that. So then they would divvy up those sites for each of the engineers, yeah. and we would run these things through scripts that have been developed to to check, you know, iOS version and equipment, and, and you know, make sure everything was was current best practice, current you know, uh, generation hardware, and, and all yeah. this other stuff. And if it wasn't. Yeah. Then we had to make the determination, was this something that we could do remotely or is this something we have to go on site for? Obviously, if it's a hardware replacement, yeah. we have to go on site for it. So then we would have to schedule out and, and everything for, for, the, uh, for that particular quarter, okay. all the work we do. And sometimes you got lucky and you only had like two hits out of a list of you know, 15 sites that, yeah. that needed changes. Um, sometimes you got very unlucky <laughs> and you had like 10 hits on, yeah. on groups of 15 and, and then... Yeah, you were traveling a whole lot, yeah. and um, yeah. So, but it uh, it was it was very cool just because I was at Cisco yeah. in that environment, um, getting exposure to all of their newer stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, because a, a lot of companies tend to hold on to their old equipment as long as they possibly mm -hmm. can, mm -hmm. let it depreciate completely, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. then they'll go ahead and upgrade. So you, you might get you know two three mm -hmm. model year or models behind yeah, yeah. and um the uh you know no not, not with cisco they want the latest and greatest at, at, at their stuff so so did you run into any weird issues because i've heard that with like these contracting companies that work with the major mm -hmm. tech companies and then especially with laws and employment stuff nowadays it can actually be a really weird like like microsoft oddly enough it was so horrible microsoft <laughs> got sued for treating their subcontractors too well 
Like because because no, the subcontractors no. got invited to the Christmas party, that then meant they were actually and like they literally got sued because they were trying to treat their subcontractors. And, nice. <laughs> so like was there no, any? No, so well Cisco had a very good relationship with STS. Okay. Um, and in it and so STS had gone through multiple acquisitions from, from different companies huh, at different okay. times. Yeah. So the original company, uh, I don't even remember the name of, of what the company was, yeah. but that had been doing the implementation stuff. A lot of these guys had been there, or like yeah. the like three of the senior guys. One was a project, uh, she was a project manager and two of the other ones were, were engineers. Yeah. Um, they had been there for years and, yeah. and working with the company under different names, you know, but somebody just kind of swooped in and, and bought them and, yeah. you know, didn't really do anything with them because they were at Cisco and there's like whatever, right? Yeah. Um, it was just kind of a branch that existed. The, uh, <laughs> um, the it, was, it, was, it was a good relationship that okay. this company, because a lot of the upper management stayed in place, so they huh. managed to, to keep that. Yeah. Yeah. What the problems we ran into is the travel. Right. Okay. That yeah. was that was the uh, the biggest issue um, because you had to to get proper visas and so because it was North and South America, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and they actually had an office over in in Europe. Um, yeah. STS did that was at Cisco offices over there in Europe that yeah. they they covered the European region and there was the mm. ASPAC re region and everything um, that did the same thing and. Um, you, you run into a, a lot of problems huh. um, sometimes with the visas, like uh, um, NAFTA. Like that, like well, no, you know, you know the North American Free yeah, Trade yeah, Agreement. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> that's why it's like so, what? Where? So a key a key part of NAFTA was yeah. like for the Canadians. Yeah. Um, companies can't bring in non-Canadian citizens to do work that Canadian citizens could do. If, yeah, okay. unless they have a very valid reason. Huh, okay. So since we're American citizens coming yeah. up to a Cisco office to do installs for Cisco equipment on Canadian soil, why can't a Canadian do it? Why does it have to be an American to do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So there's some, I was actually kicked out of Canada once. You were kicked out of Canada? <laughs> I was kicked out of Canada. Really? They were very polite about it. They're um, <laughs> very polite. Get out. Get out. Um, the, uh, we, we were going up to do, um, to check on some stuff. Yeah. yeah. And the, uh, there was a project manager that was new at the company that had never traveled to any sites before. Yeah, okay. And he had uh, uh, came with me. You know, to, to go on one site install to get a feel for how it worked and everything. Mm -hmm. And he started going on and on about how we were going to be installing all this equipment and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I was already, you know, I, I was through, <laughs> I'd been stamped and everything. I was getting ready to walk out the door yeah. and the guy waves at me and says, hey, wait for me because he's going for a second check to talk to the immigration officials. And the immigration guy that was at the door was like, you're with him? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I mean, I got one hand on the door about to walk out so I could go grab my stuff. Yeah. And they're like, well, you need to go back there with him as well then. Yeah. And I'm over here going, no, we're just here for meetings and everything. But he's going on about you know installs and all this other stuff, oh, and and uh, and we weren't even at that point yet, right? As oh, okay. far as doing installs and whatnot, we weren't we weren't at that point of huh. of, of the project yet. Yeah. You know, he was just supposed to be getting experience for for how projects progressed, yeah, okay. right? And and you know, of course, have a reason to travel a little bit. Everybody wants to travel for their job sometimes, yeah. so that was just extra justification. Um, but yeah, so he was going on about how we were going to be doing that and stuff, and it just turned into this fiasco. And oh my god! So, the, uh, so, so the lesson is you're just doing meetings. Yeah, it's meetings. It's, meetings. It, it's all it's all meetings. It's all meetings. Uh, oh, weird. So like, <laughs> so that's curious. See, so your company didn't just set all that up. I would have figured the visas, well, so, and especially if well, you deal with that a so lot. So you, it's it's possible to to get it done and everything. It's yeah. just so much of a headache to 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 go through that. Um, portion that yeah. they, uh, you know, they, they kind of say if we don't have time to get that part because it's a basis by basis type thing. And, yeah. and if you, you're supposed to be doing these things quarterly and it takes three, four months to work out the, the paperwork or, really? or whatever, yeah. you know, um, 
it's like, well, we can't do this every time we have to go to Canada. Really? So there's so, not just some kind of like just ongoing visa? I would just think you'd have like a 10 year. No, you know, no. Really? It, it's everything. because of the NAFTA agreement. You have to have, there's like some kind of form that's involved mm. that has to be approved by Canadian officials and US <laughs> officials and different companies and all kind of, I, yeah, I did not want to get into that whole so what happens with it? I mean, so do you, do you still have to pay your airfare back? I mean, do they just say no, and then you've got to pay the, or I guess the company pays the flight back? Yeah, well, so they, they, <laughs> they, they gave me the option at the window. They're like, all right, so it's, it's Friday, right? And um, they were like, so you can have a hearing if, if you want to, um, <laughs> if, if you want to try to appeal this decision, yeah. not to yeah. let you into Canada. Yeah. And, uh, but that hearing won't be until Monday and you'll have oh. to stay here. And there were yeah. little areas that with bars and stuff. And really? I, I, I don't Jesus. know for sure that that's where I would have been staying at, but, um, it could have been that I, you know, they just walked us past there just to show them to us. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but they walked us back to, to the way and then, uh, no charge for the flight back into the States from there. We had to reshuffle all of our tickets and everything and get stuff, uh, read. I think we flew into Buffalo. I think. So they just fly you to Buffalo. And yeah, they flew, and you were responsible for, <laughs> for everything else. So, yeah. Really? Was, uh, so that was, I was kicked out of Canada. Kicked out? Yeah. That, that's impressive. Oh, I, I know. How many people do you know that have been kicked out, out of Canada? Canada apparently. So. Oh, so then you go over, and so you're a senior. No, so, so this says you're an implementation engineer, because it's yes. curious, because a lot of new people, again, they see all these titles. And uh -huh. they, again, at a certain point, you're like, yeah. Does an implementation engineer, is that actually something? Or again, is that just yeah, a Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. Um, we focus solely on implementation. So a lot yeah. of the design work and stuff like that was, yeah. was already done. Okay. okay. So we focus solely on implementations, getting the things up and running, dealing with problems that, that came up, you know, because yeah. every time that you're, you're turning on new equipment, yeah, you might have this static config where you just got to change a few items for yeah. whatever reason, yeah, yeah. you know, the gremlins always like to rear their head. And, uh, so you're, you're doing that particular portion of the work and something always goes wrong, mm -hmm. you know? So obviously you just can't throw all the stuff onto the machines and ship it out there and expect it to work every single time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was, we focused purely on implementations. We did first day support and then yeah. after that we were done. Okay. You know, everything that moved over to Cisco operations, they yeah, monitored yeah, the equipment yeah, and dealt with any faults after that point. But as long as everything was good day zero, yeah, yeah. you know, um, we, we were done, you okay. know. So um, that's that we focus solely on, okay. on new stuff. Yeah, okay. So that's what implementation engineers do. They, <laughs> they, they do new equipment and, and whatnot. So yes, that is a thing uh, for a lot of you. You'll, and you'll... Uh, a lot of these other vendors and stuff, they'll, yeah. they have implementation engineers. So if a company buys a, a new kind of product, you know, or whatever, and they need those, those sales engineers or, or whatever, they might have implementation engineers that work for them that come in, do the, the new implementation to get everything up and running the way it's yeah. supposed to, and then they're done, you know, and okay. everything else is left up to you. So yeah. Interesting. that is, it is a viable track for mm -hmm. your career. And it's a good way to get introduced to, to a lot of different technology and stuff yeah. too, if, you, if, uh, if you're willing to go that route. A lot of travel involved in, yeah. in yeah. most of those uh, roles, so. So flying out of like Raleigh, I yeah. wanna think this was a great place to fly out of. Oh yeah, yeah, you Is can it? connect, yeah, they do a lot of flights, a lot of connecting flights and stuff from, oh, okay. from there. Um, a lot of places you can get direct flight. Plus, I mean, with Atlanta is, yeah, just a short hop away, and from yeah. Atlanta, you can fl or DFW, oh, yeah. you can fly anywhere. Yeah, okay. So interesting. So then we went from there to senior network engineer, Millennium Consulting. Yes. And so what is? So I yeah. worked for EMC. EMC. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a contract position for EMC. Um, fantastic, fantastic job. Really? Yes. Um, I got to work in their data center. Okay. Um, as, as so they have a center of excellence oh. lo located um, here uh, that has um, one of their main data centers yeah, um, okay. that houses a lot of different equipment. And um, so I got to work on that, but I also got, they have actually three locations in the Triangle area. They mm -hmm. have a manufacturing facility out in Apex. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have a, um, 
centered down T.W. Alexander, just right around there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that direction, like, you know, everybody is you know, just watching the camera is somewhere over there. Which way is he facing so we can find it? Um, so, and, and then they have the Center of Excellence, which is their big uh, data center. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, it, was, it was very cool because I got to work in the data center, but I also got to work for on their facility stuff as well. Hmm. And touching a lot of different moving parts, doing upgrades for stuff. Um, I actually got to do the V-Lab um, uh, re-imagining, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so EMC has, has this um, demo lab yeah, that yeah. they call V-Lab okay. that uh, customers can, can log into it. It's a virtualized thing yeah. and, and build up you know, stacks of EMC equipment to kind of virtualize the environment and, oh, and check okay. stuff out. Yeah. And they always um, show up at uh, uh, the new iteration of it shows up at EMC World oh, every year. Yeah. And um, it gets a lot of, of traffic yeah. during EMC World. And every other year, they had had tons of problems with VLAB not working. Yeah. And it was because of the way that they were trying to put it together. It was all cobbled together and things yeah, didn't yeah. fit right. And yeah, yeah. you know, they, they, they didn't migrate things well. So I came up with this whole modular design for it and huh. said, this is the way that you need to build it. Yeah. And, um, and uh, it, it was huge success. They had absolutely zero trouble from the time that they turned it on. Yeah, yeah. Um, no downtime. Everybody mm. could get into it. It was scaled yeah. out to like 32,000 customers could could use it. Okay. And um, it was it was absolutely fantastic. It was yeah. that right there was kind of a a career changing experience for me. Why was that? Well, because to this point, I had kind of you know, dealt in a lot of different areas and, and dealing with some system stuff, some network stuff, some voice stuff and, and everything like that. But I'd mm. never done anything that really kind of put everything together, yeah, okay. right? Yeah. With the way VLAB had to be done, I had to understand all the different portions and how they all fit together to yeah. come up with this design, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And it just, it clicked something in my head. <laughs> And, and this is the way that we should be looking at networking, okay, you know, yeah, as yeah. this whole environment as opposed to these components because the system guys always want to do their, the systems, this is my stuff, you yeah, know, yeah. storage, this is my stuff, yeah. you know, virtualization, my stuff, network, this is my stuff, you know, there's a definitive end and beginning of, of everybody's coverage and, yeah. you know, and you need this holistic view of, yeah. of the network to really understand and implement the solutions that, cause, you know, because regardless, everybody has a customer, right? Yeah, yeah. So obviously as a network engineer, my customer are the end users or whoever's using my network, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, you have to understand that customer's needs. Yeah. And, and if you don't understand the customer's needs, you can't put out the best solution for them. Okay. You know, obviously, okay. and, and, and networking is not a one size fits all thing yeah, at, yeah, yeah. at all. You know, a lot of companies try to take that approach for that one size fits all. We're just gonna slam a bunch of this equipment in here put VLANs on all the ports for different stuff and yeah. you know here you go you know yeah. do do whatever you need to do and 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 you know uh, yeah sure it can work in a, a brute force type method <laughs> yeah. you know but um, it is it is it classy is it yeah. sexy no it's not and uh, you know I I like these more streamlined you know things things yeah. that work the way they're supposed to work and yeah. and and there's no kludginess about it nice. so um, yeah, and so I think that was kind of a definitive change moment in, in my career yeah. um, where I started taking this more holistic view of, of networking and, and then I was working with somebody there um, that really started you know, hammering into my mind mm -hmm. Um, how I need to approach my career because mm. you know I, I had loved technology so much yeah. and and I, I kept up the date and I liked working with it and everything but I'd never for some reason I never really put the connection between you know the whole career in networking a career yeah. engineer as opposed to you know just just a job to job you know okay, yeah. and um, I, I, I it, I made that that connection because of his influence yeah. and then my view of, of how I did the network I was like you know I should start looking at things in a different way and yeah. and, and I not to brag but <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really took off as an engineer from there you know okay, that yeah. I, I became a better better engineer because of that 
So. So then, how did how did you actually get that project? So you go in there, and that's okay. So once it's done, it's dealing with thirty-two thousand people. That's really <laughs> impressive. But the question is, is who went? Oh yeah, you do. That. I had the cycles. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they were expecting. They just wanted somebody to do. You know, we need some of the switches and other parts of the infrastructure. You know, reconfigured or added and racked and yeah. and and done up, right? Yeah. And okay, you know, I was looking at it, but they were having so many problems with the previous iterator because I started talking to some of the systems guys mm -hmm. and, and the other guys that were on the project and the project manager that was in charge of it, yeah. um, I was listening in on these calls and I was mm -hmm. hearing all these previous problems. Well, we want to keep, you know, we don't want to have the problem that we had last year or the year before that with this and that and that. And I started thinking, like, yeah. you know, uh, but I had the cycles and, yeah. you know, I was there on yeah. site resource, so they gave it to me. But I started hearing these things and yeah. I was like, you know, there might be a better way. So I started looking at the old infrastructure and what they want to do with the new stuff. And I'm like, no, we need to do this instead. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I came up with this modular design where it's just, you know, the, the addition of, of these certain basic components yeah. added in as opposed to, you know, ripping out all the old stuff and putting in new stuff or cludging the, the stuff together with, with makeshift parts that don't really fit together. Yeah. yeah um, like what they were trying to do <laughs> before. Yeah. And um, I was like, if you stick with these systems or the latest iteration of these systems and these basic configs, you know, you don't have to do all these, these fancy things. This is a graceful, hmm. basic, simple way to, yeah. to do this. And, um, it, and it worked fantastically for them. But I guess that's the thing, like with the politics involved, did you go in with just a book of documentation? Was it just so eloquent? Did you just, was it poetry when you said it? Like, it, you know. it, well, actually, it's funny you should mention it. It, it was. Um, oh. it, it was. It was eloquent to, to the point where everybody was... It was like one of those... Have you ever talked to somebody and yeah. that that you, about a problem that you have and all of a sudden they have some kind of insight and you're like, why didn't we ever do this before? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and that's kind of what it was. I spoke uh, okay. up in the middle of a call, you know, because I was I was just a contractor. Yeah, right? Yeah, I wasn't yeah, an yeah. EMC employee, but yeah, I was the on site resource. Nobody expected this guy <laughs> who was just supposed to be putting this equipment in and doing some configurations to say, hey, why don't we do this? Yeah, okay. And um and 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 that's what happened. And they were like that makes a lot of sense, and so I started talking to the systems guys and and the other you know programmers that were involved with it, and they were like, yeah, this is this is going to work, yeah, yeah. and uh, and we implemented it. They tested it. Had the only problems that that they had were uh, unrelated from the network. It was just okay. with with the uh, um, storage systems uh, talking with the uh, the virtualization systems. Yeah, you know, okay. so that that was that was, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not quite there yet to fix that problem for you guys. Oh. So um, yeah, they uh, and and you know somebody at EMC thought it was it was good because I I got a bonus check oh. as a contract. Yeah, and that's uh, really you know so a lot of companies do these incentive programs and, and yeah. stuff like that where if somebody does a good job you know they can put you in for you know a little small bonus check depending on how good a job you know like a five hundred dollar thousand dollar or two you know top gold platinum whatever yeah. uh job two thousand yeah. dollar you know yeah. and contractors never get those things it's always yeah. employees recommending other employees and stuff i was put in for the top level really? uh uh prize or yeah. compensation or whatever for uh, how well of a job that i did making <laughs> vlab what it was yeah. and um, from a from a VP no less that was associated yeah. with the project yeah. so I was I was pretty pumped about that well, that's cool so then so you kind of got help with I guess what you would call a mentor then when you were with the, this person that helped you kind of rethink about how your career was going yes to yes so I, one of the big questions that always always comes up is like, how do you get a mentor? Can you get a mentor? Or is it just like somebody walks in and goes, I like the look of you. Yeah, dude, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. Find your Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. Um, Can you find, or does, does do you find Miyagi, or does Miyagi find you? It's different for everybody. Sometimes yeah. there is somebody out there that is looking for that person to pass knowledge on to. Sometimes you 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 are that person that that just loves to teach and is willing to take anybody who's willing to listen to you. Yeah, yeah that that's the you have to be willing to be mentored. Mm -hmm. You may not realize that you're willing to be mentored, but <laughs> yeah. some part of you has to be willing to be mentored. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of, uh, <laughs> it was, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story. So, um, and at, at the job, um, part of the stuff that I was supposed to do, so EMC had VCE, I don't know whether you're familiar, VCE was, was a collaboration between Cisco and EMC. And EMC had completely taken over VCE, and they had brought over uh, some guys, in, and and me and another guy who was a contractor yeah. were supposed to be learning about this this network, yeah, you know, the the VCE network and everything, so we could help support it, because yeah. uh, VCE has a local office as well, and um, so we were talking with the two guys that were in charge of the VCE network, yeah. and uh, they were trying to tell us all this stuff, and I'm on my computer or on my phone, yeah. right? Because my boss, so the other guy was a kind of a security guy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and he had a different uh, boss or manager from, from me. Yeah, yeah. And but because I was covering all these different locations, he was constantly asking me stuff or wanting me to check things out. So I was getting emails or text yeah. messages from him that he wanted me to go check the stuff. And I'm supposed to be learning about this. And I'm like, well, I'm doing this class. You want me to do it now? Yeah, go ahead and do it now. So I would get up and so so over the course of like a week, week yeah. and a half, we were supposed to learn it. I was constantly like getting up and leaving the building and going to another site and then calling yeah. and saying, hey, sorry, I left. You know, they, they they thought I was a scumbag, you know, because I wasn't paying attention or I wasn't vested in it or, or yeah. anything like that. And it, it comes. From, I, it wasn't a matter of that, you know. It was a matter that um, I, I was vested. I wanted to know, but I was being pulled in in different directions about things. And and one of those one of those guys was uh, the guy who ended up being my you know mentor uh, career wise was um, one of the VCE guys. So yeah, yeah, for months yeah, yeah, yeah. that I kinda, he he didn't want to anything to do. He's like, oh, I gotta do something with him. Once he actually got into a project with me though, where we were working side by side, he yeah. realized what was going on, that I was yeah. being drawn on a bunch of different directions, and that the other guy was only listening because he wanted to take. He had nothing to give, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? He was, he was a taker. And uh, you run into guys like that that are willing to listen, but they are not willing to offer anything up or you yeah. know assist in any way or anything like that. And uh, so he realized that I was not a scumbag and, yeah. and, and started, you know, helping me in, mm. in different things. Not only, you know, uh, not only uh, uh, technology wise, because he did very solid Cisco knowledge and um, just networking knowledge in general, but contacts and, yeah. and uh, career advice and, and stuff like that. And so yeah. I, I learned a whole lot from him. He really did help me out. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to be, you have to be willing to, to kind of place yourself under someone else and and yeah. and and listen to them because you know that's kind of a vulnerable position a, a mentor mentee relationship is yeah. you know it's it's completely different from a friendship you know? yeah um so you you have to be willing to to enter into that type of a relationship um so yeah have you had many mentors do you figure through your career yeah. uh no. no he was he was really the first one a lot of the a lot of the stuff you know i i had like you know associates that kind of did some knowledge share if i had questions about some things yeah. um I had one guy over at the EPA um, shared a lot of systems knowledge with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, would I necessarily say he's a mentor? Yeah. Sorta. Yeah. Um, he he gave me a lot some some good advice about some things here and there, but um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say he was like at that super mentor status. Yeah. You know, maybe like entry level mentor. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, the uh, the other guy though, he was definitely a mentor. And I, I I still I still talk to him. Yeah. You know, today and everything. You know, it's been a few years, but um, yeah. Anytime I got a question or, or anything like that, yeah. although I'm I'm getting closer to his level. <laughs> So do you, did you ever run into problems? Like one of the issues that I see with people when they get mentors is they don't necessarily realize a mentor isn't necessarily a friend. Did you ever run into problems like with boundary issues where you start to become so comfortable that you kind of forget, no, that's Miyagi. No, <laughs> you know I mean? no. Well, so, so my, my mentor, yeah. I also count him as a friend. You know, okay. we're, we're we're friendly with each other. We we know about each other's families and stuff, yeah. and you know, we we share. Yeah, we talk about our kids okay. and, and and all the other stuff. So um, sometimes, though, yes, I've I've seen other other people where you know they have a mentor, but yeah. I mean, it's definitely. <laughs> You know, I am not your friend. I will smite thee if you if you cross me at all. Um, so, I, I think you have to be mindful of what type of person you're dealing with. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, yeah. 
<laughs> so then, so this was like the most amazing, wonderful, greatest job in the world, and you leave it after a year. Like, yes. Why that? That seems odd. Like, because you can even see you're so smiling and had like. Ah. Uh, and then it's so only about a year. there yeah. was. Uh, there were some politics involved. Yeah, um, yeah. So I was a contractor, right? Yeah. My boss was trying to uh, work me in as a FTE, trying to find some way to bring me in to the EMC family. He okay, was yeah, he was yeah. doing everything that he could. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there was an incident where um, some people took some some switches off the loading dock that we were going to be using for a project. Okay. And um, it turns out that they thought those were just scrap switches that they could use somewhere else, mm -hmm. but they took them yeah. and we found out who took them from security because security will let us see the video footage, right? Mm -hmm. So we knew who it was, but we wanted to give them time because we didn't know why they took them. Mm -hmm. We email blasted the facility, right? Saying, you took uh, switches off. Yeah, you yeah. took switches off the dock. We need them back. They're for a project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just return them to the dock. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have you on security video, so we know oh, who it is. Yeah. But just return them. Yeah, that, that, that's all we want, and and nothing else will you know happen, right? Yeah, yeah. We told our boss what was going on and everything. Our our manager was actually based up in Boston, and. Um, the uh, the guy emailed you know and said ah oh, sorry I thought they were scrap and everything I'm yeah. taking them back right yeah. so he took them back and um, we thought that was it yeah. well I'm the one who sent the email out, uh -oh, right uh -oh. yeah. um, we both signed our names on it but it came from from my account he was an EMC employee the other guy was mm -hmm. and uh, and I was just a contractor <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <laughs> suffice to say HR got involved. Um, the, oh, the local HR manager, yeah. um, I, I don't know what it was, uh, took a great dislike, say, you can't do that. You can't utilize this, this um, email because it was, it was one of the, the email lists right, that blasted everybody in the facility. Yeah. You can't do that with that email list. You know, it's improper use and yada, yada, yada. And she yeah. started talking to the director of the facility and, you know, um, started getting involved. And they, he was talking to the director up there that, that my manager worked for. Yeah. And suffice to say, what it boiled down to is I'd already interviewed for a, a full-time position there. And yeah. they were in the process of, yeah. of working out the 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 um, salary and all this stuff yeah. like that. I was I was gonna yeah. I was gonna get an offer letter. I mean, oh, oh, and, oh, and and they they yanked it. They said uh, we can't do anything right now. And um, this was a few. This was um, like you know, like four months before the contract was supposed to be renewed. Okay. Yeah. And I talked to my manager. My manager told me what was going on, mm. and he was like, "It's politics. I I, I can't do anything right now. We kind of need to let this blow over." Yeah. Um, but good news is we got the the contract renewed, right? Okay. So so you've got that going. It was renewed for another year. Well, turns out oh. that I got blackballed. Um, they uh, the HR manager said that they would not release the funds for the contract. Um, if I was still associated with it. I have no clue what I ever did to, to this person that, that <laughs> caused them to revile me the way that they did. Yeah. I, absolutely, I, I'm still baffled by it, but it was the absolute best thing that ever happened to me. Really? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, hands down, the best thing. Uh, well, outside of my wife and kids, obviously. Job-wise, it was, yeah, because yeah. this is what happened. Yeah. Um, it forced me to go out and look for another position. And utilizing, you know, um, uh, so, some of my contacts and, and everything, and then yeah. some of, you know, my mentor's contacts came upon this job with Unicom Systems. Okay, yeah. Doing the consulting thing. I could not be happier where yeah. I'm at. I, yeah. I mean, the, the, the EMC job was, was, was cool. I, I, I learned some very cool things. Yeah. Um, got my mentor there and, and everything else, but, this job at Unicom is absolutely fantastic. Really? I, it, it is. I mean, I, I get to play with so many different systems in yeah. a bunch of different customers' environments. Yeah. I could be on Juniper one day, Cisco the next, doing wireless, doing voice, doing, you know, who knows what. 
Um, I have the the time that I need to do for research, staying up to date on technology. Uh -huh. um, it's gotten me into uh, blogging, big. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I write for Tech Target now yeah, yeah. and uh, network computing. I mean, it, this has really kind of you know blown up my career in a yeah. way that was uh, inconceivable to me, you huh. know, just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it, yeah. Getting getting blackballed was the best thing that ever happened. Yeah, blah, blah, there, <laughs> there. So so with that with HR or what? Well, I guess you're a contractor. Yeah. Because normally if you're an employee, at least they have to give you half a decent reason. Yeah. Like I can't even imagine. Like literally, they <sighs> had to give absolutely nothing. They just, all I knew is I could not be associated with the contract to get it uh, get the money the funds released for them to keep somebody in that spot. So they had to. And so there was there was no there was absolutely there was no no my boss told me what was going on yeah. on on yeah. on the outside you know I had a phone call with him and he was like but but my you hands are tied but that doesn't even make sense like like normally frankly I normally side with the boss but well, like at least yeah. what you're saying so, like you normally that doesn't even yeah, yeah. Well, so so it came it came <laughs> down to you know kind of two directors you yeah. know, level individuals vying with each other. And who knows? Maybe this HR person knew where some bodies were buried. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so suffice to say, I was was not welcome there yeah. anymore. And everybody, everybody involved in, in the facility um, that that I've been working with for yeah. the for the past year, yeah. um, they were baffled as yeah. well. They were like, "We don't understand what's going on, but yeah. you let us know if we can do absolutely anything." And I still have. You know, uh, good relationships with with them as well. So I mean, it was it's, it was just one of those weird things that there's mm. no indication, no understanding. It just yeah. happened. So would you would the advice that you give is if you are a contractor to stay out of anything that might yes. be political? Yes. Okay. If it is political or could be construed as political, yeah. you know, office politics, not political yeah, yeah, political. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, in any way, shape, or form, stay out of it. Do your job. If you are a contractor, if you're a contract. okay. just sit there and do your job. Um, you can offer input on projects and stuff like that, but yeah. overall, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you should just sit there and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> So then, so you've been bouncing around a lot, but then it, I guess it kind of goes back to that whole AT and T question. So you've yeah. been with this place a year and a half. Is this, is this your, is this your forever job or another? I think year it might be. You might bounce. Yeah, I, I mean, it, as as long as as things keep in the vein that they are. Yeah. I'm I'm happy to spend my next twenty years sure. there. Okay, I yeah. mean, I, that's that's how excited I am. I have I have an excellent manager. Yeah. Um, who's who's very understanding about you know my needs as far as you know. Uh, work-life balance go. Yeah. Um, he's he's very understanding as far as you know my driving desire to stay up to date on technology. You know he fosters that, um, and I mean it's just I, I can't read how fantastic it is yeah. the, the 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 position that I have now. It's <laughs> it's awesome. I mean I'm I'm very very excited to be where I'm at. So then, so you're about 35 at this point. If you've got more or less, if you take the military and 15 years yeah. experience. So what, where do you figure your career goes? Because I, I always say, um, there's a really snotty person that once said to me, like with me doing YouTube videos, it's like, so those who can do and those who can't teach, you know, what, what's a YouTuber? At which point I just walked away because like somebody about to smack you. Yeah. But like, so for you, and one of the things that I always tell people is like, for me, I could go out and I could be building a lot of this stuff. You just get to a certain age, you just get tired of getting called at midnight. You get tired yeah. of the stress. So for you, you're still relative, you're still five years younger than me. But like, what do you think, where do you think your career will go? Are you somebody that wants to get your hands dirty, your career? I am, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I obviously, I, I can't, I can't tell you where yeah, you know, exactly. I'll be in, yeah. in ten, another ten years, another fifteen years, or something. Yeah. You know, the, I just know I want to be working with technology. Okay. You know, networking stuff. I just, I think it's so cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I have, I have retained. I think that's that's one of the the key things that if you want to be a successful engineer, yeah. love the technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Re yeah. Really. I, I mean, you can you can be a good engineer yeah. and and just kind of work your way through it. You know. Yeah. It, but is that fun? No, yeah, it's yeah. not. You yeah. know. But if you want to be a successful yeah. engineer, 
you got to love the technology like it's one of your kids. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I've I've always retained that love. Okay. Um, you know, ever since you know, I sat down in front of a computer whenever I was a kid for the first time, and then yeah. you know. A a couple of years after that, my, my dad logged me into AOL, you know, and I was like, whoa, I'm talking to somebody that's like halfway across the country. How does this work? And yeah. so I started reading books on it. I've retained that, that love and desire to understand how technology works. And yeah. um, the, uh, it's, it, it, it's cool. And so I, I don't know where I'll be. I know I'll be working. Do, do I mind getting my hands dirty? No, yeah. I, I don't. I mean, there's always going to be, you, you will never uh, be too good of an engineer to rack and stack your own equipment, all <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, if yeah. you ever get to the point where you think you're too good of an engineer to rack and stack your equipment, yeah. you need to reevaluate things. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, I've got a story about that, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're never too good of an engineer to rack and stack your own stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, anyone who tells you that they are is, is a fool. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, if, if that's what it takes, yeah, it, yeah I just want to continue to work with the equipment. Oh, okay. you know, that's yeah, that's yeah. The, the technology, that's the key thing for me. So. so do you see though, because that's one of the issues, like I have a lot of like older folks that contact me. Again, they want to get their hands dirty. And I tell them, man, you're getting close to 50, and you yeah. say you want to get your hands dirty. Like, you know, there's like, why? <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you? So, like, in, in your field, do you see 50-year-olds getting their hands dirty, racking and stacking? Well, okay, so, all right. So, racking and stacking, you know, equipment has gotten progressively smaller, with the yeah. exception, it, you know, in a few cases. Yeah. But, you know, the, uh, yeah. You know, we yeah. actually, we had some, um, some data center guys that uh, were the technicians over at EMC, and and they were they were older gentlemen. Yeah, okay. You know, I'm I'm not going to say they're like super old or anything, <laughs> yeah. but I uh, I mean the uh, they were um, silver maned foxes. Yeah, yeah how about yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, if if they see this, yeah, they, <laughs> they'll they'll know who I'm talking about. Um, and and that's that's what they did. They ran cable and fiber, yeah. and and they racked and sacked the equipment for us, and. Yeah. Um, if we put in a request, you know. yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, then that's what they did. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be a 70 or 75 year old <laughs> racking and stacking equipment. Yeah. But you know, if you're just having to rack stuff up now, I, I will say cable running um, is probably a young man's game, yeah. especially when you're dealing with crawl spaces or yeah, yeah. or plenums and, and stuff like that. You know, yeah. I, I, I even now I don't think I would want to be crawling yeah. around in those if I didn't have to. Yeah. Um, so it, it happens on occasion that, that I have to, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could see myself being 50 years old and doing that, yeah, you know? Okay. So, so what about, cause we talked about the young people going into it. And again, we, I have a lot of people retraining again, they're 40. Mm -hmm. So they're 40 years old. They come here to deliver pizzas, get into the IT world <laughs> uh, again. Uh, would you advise them to start with technical support? Yes. Really? I mean, okay. it, it, this technical support, first support, is the best way to, to get, you know, introduced to the stuff. Yeah. You know, if, if you're taking classes on the side or you got your certification or whatever, okay, yeah, that's fine and dandy. But you need some way to get hands-on. And again, yeah. technical support is yeah. drudgery. All right, okay. nobody likes being level one support. I, I, I know, <laughs> sure. I have met absolutely, you know, I think maybe two people in my life who actually, actually enjoy being, you know, level one support. And um, so no one wants to do it long term, but yeah. it's, a, it's a fine way to get experience and exposure and, and everything else. So whether it's, it's you're going in being the technician that's running the cables and mm -hmm. getting just familiar with the physicality of the equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Not so much the command line, um, but just how everything connects together. Yeah. Um, do that if that's what you have to do. Do okay. the level one support for a year or two, yeah, you know, yeah. if you have to. Yeah. But you need some way to get your foot into the door in the industry, okay. you know. It, and so you do what it. I mean, it's it's just like you know, uh, the the actors out in L. A. or whatever. If they have to do a hemorrhoids commercial <laughs> to break in and get that Screen <laughs> Actors Guild, yeah, yeah. you know, membership, then I guess that's what they have to do. You know, of course, their face is plastered all, and they're associated with hemorrhoids now yeah. but that uh, this too shall pass you yeah. know? Shall. All right. so then you're talking about so now you're doing your thing you're doing all of that and then you're talking about writing so you write for um, packet pushers blog and yes. tech target 
So is that pomp and circumstance? Is that actually good for your career? Does that actually pay you any money that you care about? Yeah, well, I necessarily care about. Pay um, for a pack vacation? It, yeah, well, it, pay, it can pay for a vacation. Pack yeah, of Pushers okay. doesn't. Put it, pack of Pushers, uh, they have a community blog section. Okay. Right, and, and actually, so last year, yep. at the beginning of the year, toward you know, maybe a month or two in, um, I, there, one of the guys in, in our office, um, Who's actually leaving, but uh, he's going to another company. But he's a he's a V expert for for VMware, right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And and how you get that designation is being a community contributor. And and how he does that is he does uh, blogs. He blogs a whole lot, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. And he'd always been going on with it. And you know I've always enjoyed writing from whenever I was younger. Mm -hmm. I always thought blogs were maybe a little kind of silly because um, yeah, who really wants to read <laughs> what you know I have to say about anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, so I, ch I wrote one, I did one blog post about something that we, we set up. Uh, we did an RTC server, real time communications um, and uh, server because this, we had this really bad snowstorm that, and ice storm that came through last year okay. that shut down the triangle off and on, you know, for, for uh, at a time, a um, few days at a time. And yeah. so we were all stuck at home. So yeah. we were doing this stuff and we were trying to figure out a good way to communicate with each other instead of just doing email. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, you know, there's the open source um, uh, RTC server, you know, let's install this as a VM in our lab and yeah. we, we can all VPN in and I'll make sure the, the lab uh, uh, firewall is set up to do split tunneling. Yeah. That yeah. way we'll still keep doing our own internet connections, just everything else right. points back into the lab for the for the server or the resources and everything. Mm. They're like, okay, yeah, that's a great idea. So we got that up and running. And it was an interesting experience trying to, you know, uh, get everything going between the two because it took about a day and a half just mm. because of, of how, you know, like maybe someone had a power outage yeah, or, or, or okay. something, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. or the internet went down <laughs> for somebody else. You just try to get everything up and running. But yeah. by the time we got it up and running, it was like, oh yeah, great, you know. Yeah. So I, I just, I wrote about the experience to, okay. to start up the blog and, um, it's a, a dude on the net yeah. dot, dot com. Um, so, so there's one blog post there, <laughs> yeah. one, yeah. Um, and and that was it. I didn't have the time, you know, for it, and yeah. I was just you know super busy. At the beginning of this year, yeah. I, I I really started looking at my career, trying to figure out what what would make me a better engineer. You know, okay. and and not only that, but do I have anything to share or insights? You know, yeah. maybe I might have some some valuable um, information, and and I felt like I would, I needed to give something back. Yeah. You know, like mentor wise. Okay. And so packet pushers uh, for anyone who's not familiar, which. I would think most people who would be watching this would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you get a lot of good in-depth information about things. Yeah. Um, they do a lot of deep uh, deep dives on, on technology and everything, but they don't, you know. Here and there, there's some some mentoring articles that pop up from time to time. Yeah. But so And that's kind of the, the, the bit that, that I took there. Okay, yeah. And... Um, the uh, I, I wanted to you know kind of give some mentoring advice back, and the very first post that I did yeah. was about being a generalist as opposed to being a specialist. Yeah. It like, yeah, it's yeah, called yeah, yeah. stop being a specialist, oh, okay. and that generated so much noise. Really? Yeah, yeah. there was a lot of people that that uh, um, went to me on Twitter or were yeah. mentioning it, and they talked about it in Reddit and and, and other stuff like that. That um, I was like, really? Okay, so yeah, it kind of resonated with yeah, some folks. Yeah. And, um, and that's actually what caused Tech Target to contact me to see if I'd be willing to do a, a guest post. Oh, okay. And they liked the guest post so much oh, yeah, yeah. that um, they invited me to be a regular contributor. Oh, and okay. then that spread out from just search SDN at Tech, yeah. you know, uh, Tech Target to search networking now. So I do yeah. posts for search networking as well. And I mean, it's really snow. I mean, this was in January, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and this has really snowballed for huh. me. It's really weird. Um, I, I'm just, I'm really kind of shocked about mm -hmm. how things took off. And yeah, the, uh, it's, it's an interesting experience, but I, I found that it, it helps me to formulate my thoughts ab about things yeah. and, and getting that information out there about yeah. just my, and you know, look, outlooks, you know, 
um, are a dime a dozen. You know, everybody's got an outlook, everybody's got an opinion about everything, you know. Um, I'm just throwing my two cents into the mix. Yeah. Um, I hope it helps somebody or, or at least, you know, makes somebody think about something harder. And even yeah. if they take a completely different stance from me, that's fine. At least they put the thought into it. Yeah. Um, and so I, I did realize that there is some value in, in doing that. So if, mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter what you have to say, yeah. say it. You know, put it out there for the community at large. You know, you may not be welcomed. You, not everybody may agree with you. They may think you're stupid yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. or, or any of the above, but you, at least you had the cojones to go yeah. out and do it, you know, and because that, that's not everybody. Not everybody can actually go out and, and put words into yeah. uh, a coherent thought and, and share it with everybody else. So um, if you've ever thought about doing it, do it most definitely. So with that, though, I mean, like the generalist versus specialist thing. I mean, it is interesting to talk about in this interview. Yeah. It's not exactly earth shattering, though. No, so, it's not. So, it's so not why? earth shattering. But you know, so I, for <laughs> whatever reason, I don't know what it is. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, the networking field in 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 particular yeah. is so enamored with the specialist. We brought in a specialist, yeah. you know, I, I just, some people have probably heard that term, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, before, you know, that we're having some problems, we're going to bring in a specialist, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, okay, granted, yes, and I, I think I said this earlier, you know, specialists are, are fine in some yeah. cases, yeah, yeah. but if you want your network to run yeah. in, in this just magical way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, understanding all the key points and that's that's really what I'm, i mean it's okay yeah. to have a specialty something everybody's going to have one area that they're better at than than yeah. something else but what, what i mean basically as as the generalist is yeah. to to have this holistic view to understand the other components even at a very basic level yeah. is to mean that that you can cater your services you know it, from a network viewpoint, yeah. as opposed to just expecting, oh, look, I built the network, stuff runs over it. Yeah. You know, if it doesn't work, it's your problem. I, I don't want nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, which you run into some of those guys from time to time. It's, yeah. it's never the network. You know, it's <laughs> absolutely never the network. And yeah. Of course, nine times out of ten, it's not the network. Yeah. But you know, you, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. You know? And so that's what I mean by being a generalist is understanding. The yeah. other technology, even at a base level, will yeah. assist you in in being a better network engineer. Yeah. You know, and you know, on, on top of that, understanding coding, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's a big thing in Python, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge thing now, um, especially from an automation or a DevOps perspective and, yeah. and stuff like that. You know, so everybody wants to learn Python or Go or JavaScript or whatever. Yeah. Um, the uh, learning how to code gives you a different mindset yeah. about things. It teaches you to think about and, and approach problems in a different manner than you yeah. would. You know, so I, I, I think that in turn makes you a better troubleshooter. You know, so it, 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 these are skills that all build off of each other. Yeah. So why would you want to, to forego that just because it belongs in a different arena than, than what you normally deal with? It doesn't make sense to me. If if something, uh, I I, kinda, I have I have a, a, a motto or a mantra: yeah. be a better engineer by desire yeah. instead of by necessity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of you know a thing that I've I told myself and I've yeah. taken to heart, and that's the basis that I try to operate off of. But with the blog post and all that taking off, though, what I was kind of wondering is more. You know, there's three reasons it can happen. You know, either you're the big mouth that says what everybody already knows, but nobody for some reason will say it. Either that or you're very eloquent. You very eloquently put it. I don't know about it, that. Uh, or you come at it with some slightly new arguments. Yeah. Like, and so I'm just wondering, like, with, with your success. I don't, I don't you, you know. Don't I know. have absolutely no clue whether it's the fact that I'm the big mouth that just says what everybody already knows, <laughs> yeah. but I just said it louder. Yeah. Or I don't think it's because I'm eloquent. It might be, uh, I don't know, I've been told I'm kind of funny. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, I, I, I do. So my, I, I do take a slightly humorous bent with some of my pack yeah. of pusher posts. Okay. But um, the, uh, I, I, I like that. Um, 
as far as new arguments, I just I, I tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if if I see something that is in you know, a particular way, I, mm -hmm. I I think you know I just say whatever it is. I don't frame it. I I do formulate my ideas yeah. you know very easily. That may be what it is. Okay. Um, I do have a tendency to speak in plainer terms yeah. than a lot yeah. of people do. Okay. Um, some people like that you know facet. Yeah. Better just yeah, dropping all these technological. That, that's one thing I've I've seen with with Tech Target yeah. is is I'll put in you know uh, a, an article and they go through and they'll they'll expand some of the some of the technological terms or they'll add uh, uh, add things yeah, in there yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and, and I'm like oh, I'm not exactly that wordy or or yeah. technology dropper you know yeah, type yeah. type thing you know I I kind of you. Know, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying I want to operate or, or cater to the lowest denominator, yeah. but I, I want to be easy to understand the, the point I'm trying to convey. No. Yeah, so that, that's really what I'm looking, because an entry level engineer, or somebody who's trying to get into that, if, if I start talking about, you know, DMVPN and we're talking about a layer three VPN overlay and stuff, they're gonna be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I'm gonna say it, say it in simpler terms, you yeah. know, so everybody, you know, you know, granted that senior engineer that's been doing this stuff for 20 years might think I'm an idiot, but <laughs> whatever, yeah. you know, at mm -hmm. least everybody's gonna understand what I'm saying. Yeah, so. okay, cool. Well, coming close to the end, so I guess one of the questions I have then is, so with all of this, what is a technology that you're really excited about? What do you think is the, the technology for the next five years? So much <laughs> so technology. Much, really. um, <laughs> one of the things I'm excited about is, is SD-WAN, you okay. know, kind of that component of, of SDN. Okay. Um, so what do you mean by SD? Because I know okay, SDN. Okay, software defined. It's right. not, yeah, but what, what do you mean software defined WAN? Is, well, so, isn't that SDN? I mean, isn't that, isn't that just another, isn't, isn't that just another technology word? Yeah, well, it, it is a technology <laughs> word, so, so I'm so happy you asked. Yeah. Um, all right, so basically what we're looking for is the ability to quickly and easily deploy branch offices, Yeah. Okay. right? So the smaller offices uh, deploy the premise equipment or the edge equipment yeah. in a way so as to, you know, make it easier to open up offices, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, easier to add technologies, um, mm -hmm. add services, yeah. uh, an easier way to control and reconfigure everything if you, you need to do that, an easier way to uh, visualize your network, yeah. you know, and, and that's really what, uh, what SD-WAN encompasses, <laughs> software-defined WAN. Yeah. Um, Basically, what, what you what you get, and there's a few different companies doing it. Viptela, Cisco, um, they're doing it. Riverbed, uh, yeah. Riverbed's getting into the game. Talari, Silver Peak, a yeah, bun bunch of different people. Um, so a lot of them are startups, yeah, because yeah, okay. that's just the big thing. Yeah. But uh, the the cool thing about it is, imagine so. Before, if a company wanted to open up an office or needed to make changes to the edge equipment or whatever, they had to send an engineer out there. And the engineer had to come up with all this stuff and the configuration and schedule downtime and all these other things and plug it all up and, yeah. and, and, and do that. And you might be lucky to salvage you know, a, a few hours out of an entire weekend. Yeah. Now, with, with some of these technologies, you get what's called zero touch deployments, right? Yeah. Where you plug this device into the network, yeah. you turn it on, you, you plug it into whatever internet or uh, connection that it has with, uh, and it comes up and it goes out and finds its controller. <laughs> out in the cloud, really? you know, or yeah. wherever you deployed it in, in another data center or something like that, um, mm -hmm. depending on who the vendor is. Uh, is what it does, and um, the <laughs> it grabs its configuration and yeah. and and comes up, and everything's kind of set for you, yeah. you know, um, because you've done all these pre-configuration tasks for your network. You've defined how you want your QoS to operate, what yeah. services you want to have um, uh, priority over everything else, yeah. uh, you know, all, all these all these cutoffs for like, you know, jitter and, and everything else. And, and so you have this hybrid WAN model that you're using broadband internet alongside MPLS or, mm. or whatever else, or yeah. there's some places that are using just broadband internet, right? right? Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's the new thing. And it, right. 
creates this secure layer three VPN overlay. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, so, but it, it creates an overlay over yeah. the network and, and basically it's securing all the transmissions over regular public internet. Huh, interesting. And um, the, uh, it, it's, it's really cool technology just yeah. because now you've decreased the time that you have to spend on site or even sending somebody out there. You can have the janitor walk into the closet right. and plug the thing in and yeah. it's, it's all done remotely. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you get in, into these areas. So, so SD-WAN's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, just the, any of the software, yeah, SDN yeah. uh, stuff, software-defined yeah. network stuff. NFV network virtualization, uh, network virtualized functions. Uh, uh, the that's some really cool, you know, things to uh, yeah. deploying um, services on on a virtualized uh, uh, server. Yeah. You know, as needed, push of a button. You know, yeah. well, we need an extra Wilsey or we need a firewall on site. Yeah. Click a button and boom, you've got a firewall out there that's already pre-configured with with using the known settings for your your network segment. There, yeah. it it you know just generates what what it needs for the configuration and, and yeah. goes. Huh. Yeah, so all yeah, it's it's a wild time. <laughs> what yeah. uh, we're we're living at just huh. because hey, you know, um, we're lazy engineers now. I think that's <laughs> like, what yeah. you know. I said earlier, you get a lot yeah. of innovation from from laziness, and I think yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. You know, someone who was who was particularly brilliant yeah. and lazy yeah. came yeah. up with this idea. Um, but yeah, there's 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 a ton of cool things out there that I, I tried to stay up with. Yeah. So I guess that's the question then, because like even with I and E, I mean that that's one of the issues is Cisco owns sixty percent of the market. Yeah. But the thing is. It actually is only 60. Like, there's yeah, still 40% of dude. what. And so, how the hell? Because it's like, if you want your CCIE, you throw INE a few bucks, you study your butt off. Yeah. But, like, Riverbed and all of these names, like, I can't even keep track of all the names. Yeah. How do you learn that stuff? You've got to go out there and you find it. You, really? you, you can't. Well, so I, I, I have a good position because. I do consulting and everything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, one that gives me access to customer networks. You know, yeah, yeah. they they may have these things to pull. Another good thing is, you know, I can shoot an email off to to the sales guys in any one of these companies. Say, hey, I do professional services. I'd like to know more about your company, so I can kind of mm -hmm. use you as as a you know something to keep in my back pocket. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they're more than willing to set up time to talk with me and uh -huh. explain the technology. Maybe send me a little documentation. Huh. Or once in a while, I get yeah. a freebie or or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or some kind of demo equipment that I could play around with with a little while, and I take it back in the lab, slap it in. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, there there are some benefits okay. there. Um, I don't think you would necessarily get that if you worked at Cisco or yeah, EMC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, one of the larger vendors like that. I, I doubt anybody would be willing to ship you equipment like yeah. that. But um, so I just I, I just go out and I read. I scour the web. I read other people's blog posts who are dealing with the technology. Okay. Um, yeah, to to try to keep up with with it because there's just so much and it changes so often. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, yeah, there's there's a lot of good resources out there that they're just just sitting there so so is there something you do that like I mean the good part with going with Cisco or EMC or any of these companies is more or less as long as you stick with their core product the core product lines you know what you're getting uh -huh. what is the decision process like with a, this SD WAN you know brand new startup company what is the purchasing decision on tens of thousands of dollars in equipment on if this is their first or second product what what would make a company go with yeah, this yeah, startup yeah, company? Yeah. Oh wow! I mean, <laughs> I don't even know. It, it, I think it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they go out and and demonstrate. They demo the equipment. They yeah. go to trade shows, or, or or they just try to get FaceTime in front of potential customers. Yeah. You know, and and there is you know some they they try to talk to people who are voices in the community and yeah. say, look at our product, yeah, look yeah. what it can do, and and so they want people to write about it or, or demo it. You know, Tech Field Day. Yeah. Is is a big thing. A lot of these companies. Are you familiar with Tech Field Day? No, no. Okay, so um, uh, Tom Hollingsworth and Stephen Foskett. Okay. Uh, they run this thing called Tech Field Day. 
Huh, okay. And um, there's uh, Tech Field Day has you know, kind of overarching. There's Storage Field Day, Networking Field Day, Mobility Field Day, um, uh, and Tech Field Day. So all and and it gives all these companies a means to um, kind of showcase their technology over mm -hmm. a few days. So you might have one or two presentations per day. Okay. And what happens is they the delegates are selected. From the community, okay, right, yeah, yeah. and um, from the uh, the the networking community, or storage community, or virtualization community, whatever, yeah. and uh, these are guys who blog or do podcasts and, and all that, and they bring these guys in, yeah. and and all of their expenses are paid, the flights paid, hotel, food, that type of thing. They they aren't paid yeah. in any way, uh -huh. and they don't have to blog or write about or talk about these products at yeah. all in one way or the other. Yeah. They, they, it's not required, but it's kind of expected yeah. of them. Yeah. And, and these guys, they do in-depth deep dives to the technology and they ask all the questions everybody might potentially ask. And then they, they write about it or they yeah. podcast you know, about it. And, uh, and so you get a lot of good information there. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with Tech Field Day, yeah. go find Tech Field Day follow them you know, on Twitter or one of these guys and and you can see the new technologies as they're coming out and there's mm -hmm. a ton of, of YouTube videos because they, they film it as okay. well as live stream. Yeah. So if you missed a stream, you can go back and look at some of the older ones. Okay. And um, that's one good way to, to, to keep up with it um, and, and how some of the startups get out there. But I mean, it's really them just pushing at trade shows and trying yeah. to get in front of customers. Huh. And if you can demonstratively show how your product is different than say someone like Cisco's or HPE or, or whatever, yeah. um, then that, that's also a key factor yeah. as well. Okay. You know, the uh, um, Viptela, uh, yeah. is, is one of the SD WAN guys, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And and they they beat Cisco out for the yeah. Gap account, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And it's uh, <laughs> it, it was actually kind of a big deal because they ended up replacing their edge infrastructure from Cisco to Viptela, or they're in the process of still doing. It. Yeah. I don't know if they're complete yet, but uh, they uh, they they moved that along because Viptela had an easily deployable solution. Okay. And, you know. Um, uh, Cisco IWAN, you know, which is their SD WAN stuff, you know, yeah. that's kind of subcomponent there. Um, it works. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult to get deployed, but yeah, it works, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And but that was a problem. They couldn't stand up these new stores in time. But all of a sudden, now you've got this Viptilla product where you're standing up 60 stores in a weekend, you know, wow, wow, just wow, yeah, wow. and yeah. they're just tossing out and 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 we're like. Yeah, this makes perfect sense. It does what we need it to do. Yeah. It's simple. It's easy. You know, and, and I think that's what a lot of these startup companies are, are trying to get to because, mm. you know, Cisco makes great product, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. They do great things. Um, but the problem is, is they've gotten too large, right? right? Huh. And, and a lot of the times this stuff uh, uh, has become too complicated. Yeah, okay. And when you get a simple product that does just what it's supposed to do, yep. And it's easily deployed, and it's cheaper. Yeah, people are going to go for that a lot of the time. Cool. So cool. Well, I think we've been talking for quite a while. I, now. I, think, I think so too. I think the camera guy is like <laughs> so, <laughs> too long. <laughs> so it was a good interview. Good talking with well, you today. It's nice talking with you yeah, too. Learned a lot. So this was Will Merrill with uh, Senior Network Engineer at Unicom Systems Inc. A lot of a lot of good information today. <laughs> Enjoyed doing this interview, and I'll see you guys in the next one.